Hello and a very warm welcome to Yes Bank and CNBC TV 18 present the Growth Summit, Vision for a $10 trillion Economy in Association with Max Life Insurance. I'm your host, Mukda Kalra, and it's a delight to see all of you here. India's economic journey has been extraordinary, propelling us towards the $10 trillion economy mark by 2030. As we march towards this milestone, it is very crucial to recognize the drivers, uh, contributors from MSMEs and large enterprises to advisories and startups, each playing a very important role in our economic resilience and growth. Now, this growing economic prowess has been fueled by multiple factors, particularly good governance, diversity, sustainability, digitech, innovation, manufacturing, employment generation, and an overall focus on a growth that is holistic and also inclusive. Now, the Hyderabad chapter of the Growth Summit is not just a reflection on these efforts, but it is also a platform to amplify the strategies and perspectives that can escalate India's journey to becoming an even stronger economy. Now, this summit is a conglomerate of uh, policymakers, corporates, leaders, tech visionaries, entrepreneurs, and innovators, whom we are seeing here sitting in the audience. And we are all here to discuss and deliberate upon India's rise as an economic powerhouse. Now, one of the strongest pillars for achieving India's economic prowess has been the banking sector. And India's banking sector has accelerated the nation's economic growth through its robust structure and persistent performance. Amidst this, of course, stands Yes Bank, one of the leading private sector banks that not only endorses India's economic vision, but is also set to catalyze the process through its products, offering, and its commitment to a technology-driven approach with customer centricity. To further deliberate on the bank's vision, we have with us a visionary leader with over 35 years of experience in the banking sector, Please join me in welcoming the turnaround specialist and the chief architect of Yes Bank of today, Mr. Prashant Kumar, MD and CEO, Yes Bank, for his opening address. Uh, very good evening and welcome to all our esteemed guests in the city of Hyderabad. And as Mugdha was sharing, uh, this is the event, this is the fifth in the series. Uh, we have done in Mumbai, Delhi, uh, Ahmedabad, Bangalore, uh, and today we are meeting in Hyderabad in terms of uh, how everybody uh, in the ecosystem, uh, whether this is in terms of policies, whether it is in terms of the corporates, the entrepreneurs, the bankers, uh, the thought leaders, how we can come together, discuss, and contribute uh, in our goal of achieving the $10 trillion economy uh, by 2030. Uh, we are extremely fortunate uh, uh, to be the citizen of this country, uh, which is the fifth largest economy and aspiring to be the third largest economy uh, by 2030. And that is something uh, which is bound to happen. It's only maybe a, it can happen one year earlier than what you were thinking or maybe a little delay. Uh, but the issue is more in terms of that the way the country is progressing, not only we are targeting to be the third largest economy, we are also targeting to be a developed country by 2047. And I think this is very, very important that not only growth in the GDP is one side, but when we talk about the developed country, we also talk about the 140 crores Indians where their standard of living goes up and where everybody enjoys the fruit of the development. And I think this is something which is uh, very, very critical. What we have seen the feedback from the last uh, four editions or the events in different cities when we are talking about the growth, the most, the most important part is contribution by everybody. Okay. We are seeing like there are so many events which are happening globally. 
uh, where we don't have much control. Uh, whether we talk about recession in some of the economies after the COVID, uh, whether we talk about the Ukraine war, whether we talk about some more events on the geopolitical side, what happening in China, but definitely those things are uh, absolutely not under our control. So I think it's very, very important uh, how we can protect Indian economy from any impact of the global impact. And for that, I think what is more important is in terms of leveraging our own strength and insulating us from the global side. One of the most important requirement of our country for a very, very long time was in terms of having the right kind of infrastructure. And I think what we have seen in the last couple of years, a massive amount of infrastructure investment from government of India, uh, whether we talk about the railways, whether we talk about the airports, whether we talk about the roads infrastructure, the digital infrastructure, everywhere there is a huge investment and we are seeing the results out of those investments. Along with the huge investment on the infrastructure side, I think we are also seeking in terms of how we can make it a very large manufacturing hub. Not only a large manufacturing hub, but also in terms of a global export hub. And we have seen in terms of a huge investment for manufacturing. We are seeing the PLI schemes for different sectors coming from government of India. And very recently, uh, we have started investing even in the semiconductors. So we are expecting like in next three, four years, even the semiconductors would start manufacturing in India and we can be an exporting hub for the rest of the world. Now, when we are talking about the investment, when we are talking about the making our country as a manufacturing hub, we also see in terms of what is going to happen over a period of time. The estimate is that by 2031, 69% of our population would be the working class. It means that age group is very, very important. And when 69% of the population would be in the working class, you need to give them the support. Not only you need to give them the support in terms of job opportunities, we need to talk about their housing need, we need to talk about their consumption needs. We also need to talk about, you, you can't create job for so many people. It means we need to encourage the entrepreneurship. And when we are talking about the manufacturing, such a large working population, we are talking about the entrepreneurship. It means also in terms of support to the MSMEs. The current estimate is that if we would like to support the MSME sector in our country, uh, we require something around 250 trillion Indian rupees of investment and the credit in the MSME sector over a period of time. And here, the support is required both from the banking sector side and also in terms of investment, also in terms of training the MSMEs. MSMEs, they don't require only the funding support. Uh, the MSMEs also require the support in terms of training, in terms of marketing their products, in terms of how we can strengthen their entrepreneur skills. Another very important part in the whole development is also in terms of how we can be self-reliant on the energy side. And I think everybody is seeing, especially on the energy, unless we move into the green fuel, I, I think there is a threat to the humanity that we are seeing on the climate change, everything what is happening. And again, uh, the ambition of uh, reaching to a green energy source of 500 gigawatt by 2031 uh, would be requiring something around 2.5 trillion Indian rupees of investment. So I think these are some of those very, very large things where government of India, the various state governments, they are making the investment they are supporting. But at the same time, the support from the private sector and the banking sector is also very critical. And this is, this is the feedback, this is, this is the ask uh, from everyone that how soon 
uh, the investment from the private sector would start coming. How we would be able to understand what is the requirement of the entire country uh, and the putting our resources uh, into that part. The another very large area uh, is also in terms of the digital infrastructure. Today, our country is a leading country for the across the globe in terms of and making not only the payment system digital, but also creating the digital public infrastructure. Whether we talk about the UPI payments, whether we talk about the digital currency, uh, whether we talk about making the credit available through digital means, I think our country is in the forefront. But to remain in the forefront, we need to continuously invest on the IT side using new and new technology, whether we talk about the artificial intelligence, whether we talk about the Gen AI, whether we talk about the machine learning, but definitely unless uh, we use the technology and evolve with the new technologies, uh, I think there would be issues in terms of productivity, there would be issue in terms of supporting the entire population. Another dimension, and which we are seeing again, our country is leading, is in terms of the startup ecosystem. Now, startup ecosystem is not only critical in terms of bringing the innovation, but also in terms of creating the entrepreneurial skills, transforming the businesses, and also creating the jobs. I, I think our country is taking that leading position. And we need to continuously support our startup ecosystem around this. We have seen in the past when we started opening the Jandhan account, and we were thinking like opening the Jandhan account may be one of the other welfare measures. But I think today we are seeing the advantage. Advantage of opening the accounts of every Indian, opening the account digitally, and we are seeing the benefit in terms of like when the direct benefit transfers or the government subsidies are being passed on to uh, more than 100 million people, there are no leakage. It means we are able to protect, we are able to save lot of vestiges uh, which was otherwise happening in the system. Now the next stage would be how we can provide credit to our 1.4 billion population in the country. Because unless we are able to provide credit without any hassles, without any friction, then bringing every Indian to a upper strata, to a much better lifestyle, would be definitely a challenge. I think entire banking sector, uh, with the support of FinTech, and I am using these words uh, very, very consciously, that banking sector along with the FinTech, because we don't want to have any friction between the fintechs and the banking sector where there is a question whether the fintechs would win the war or the banking sector. Our philosophy is that it's a partnership between the banks and the fintechs uh, which can actually work for the betterment of the country. I think these issues are very, very critical and at the same time, I think the entire processes, the entire technology, the entire thought process uh, has to be ESG compliant. Because if we are talking about the sustainable development, the sustainable development cannot happen if we take certain short-term measures, which is going to come back to us, to haunt us, the humanity, and our future generations would be impacted because of the risk like the climate risk. At Yes Bank, we are trying to contribute in all these aspects whether this is a support to the MSME sector, whether this is contribution to the startup ecosystem, whether it talks about the ESG and the climate risk. I think in each of those areas, uh, we are playing some of the leading roles. Uh, we take very pride in saying like, today every third digital transaction of the country uh, is being supported by ESPEC. And we are talking about the billions of transactions. Uh, if we talk about the digital transaction in the country, if you include all kind of uh, sourcing, whether it's a UPI, NEFT, RTGS, we are talking about 14 billion transactions a month. 
and one third of those transactions uh, are being supported by Yes Bank. Uh, I think you must have seen like yesterday uh, after the problems on the Paytm side, NPCI has come out with a notification uh, where Yes Bank has been made the nodal bank uh, for taking care of the entire UPI transaction for the customer as well as on the merchant acquisition side. And that talks about the strength of our bank on the digital side. Uh, similarly, we are also known in the forefront for promoting the MSMEs. Uh, again, 30% of our balance sheet is actually is coming from the MSME uh, sector. All our policies are also aligned in terms of the ESG, uh, which becomes very, very sustainable development. And again, uh, we are proud uh, to be a bank which is the highest rated ESG compliant bank in the India amongst all the banks. The only effort from my side is in terms of we are a small bank, but we are trying to contribute in all those significant areas uh, which would take our country towards the path of $10 trillion economy, as well as becoming this as a developed country. We also appreciate when we, we talk about the development and the inclusive development of the country, definitely there would also be wealth creation. And I think the thought process should not be to look down uh, the people who creates wealth. I think this is also very, very important for the country to not only recognize, appreciate, support the wealth creators and the wealth. And in this endeavor, we also think in terms of how the bank can support our HNIs and where the estimate is that in next two to three years, uh, the number of HNIs would double. Yes Bank has also come out uh, with a special curated program, uh, which we call as a Yes Private, uh, to take care of the specific needs of our HNI clients. And I think today we are very happy to launch our Yes Private program uh, in Hyderabad. And I would request my colleague uh, to please uh, show a AV uh, on our program, which is the Yes Private. For some. Success is just the beginning, and with the right insights, their wealth can help them reach newer, greater height. Their path is paved with victories, and with the right partner, each one becomes an opportunity for another. Most define their own pinnacles, but a rare few define it for others. They are the visionaries, the pioneers, the unrelentingly aspirational, and they need a banking partner that knows what it takes to turn their grand vision into reality. Yes, private. A buy invite only, thoughtfully curated suite of superior personal and business banking solutions. With your own wealth studio that delivers personalized investment solutions to empower your wealth management decisions. Differentiated product offerings to match your stature. Exclusive lifestyle privileges. Along with the best in class enterprise banking program and solutions to ensure that your legacy lasts forever and to bring it all together a dedicated team which helps you optimize your strategy by harmonizing all our product offerings yes private bespoke personal and business banking solutions uh, thank you so much again for uh, coming and sparing your time for attending this event. Uh, we have lined up some very, very uh, interesting conversation with the uh, leaders uh, from the policy side, leaders from our uh, corporates, the leaders from the SME, and look forward for a very, very exciting evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prashant.
it's always a pleasure listening to you and of course an insightful and a very uh, uh, impactful start to the summit and as uh, mr kumar already said we have uh, tons and tons lined up for you so let's start with the first session and the theme of the upcoming session is unleashing the animal spirit building the right support structure for growth now this panel is uh, going to explore the essential elements needed to foster a conducive environment for economic expansion and innovation from regulatory frameworks to investment incentives we'll uncover strategies to ignite the entrepreneurial zeal and drive sustainable growth so without further ado it's my honor and privilege to invite on stage jude sanet from cnbc tv 18 for a fireside chat with mr shrinivas rao mahakali ceo t hub good evening ladies and gentlemen you know every time we talk about essentially india's growth story i think one conclusion that we've all arrived at is that it is by now a foregone conclusion india is well and truly on the path to growth and as a very dear friend of mine described it to me merely a couple of weeks ago in this very city it's pretty much reminiscent of what the us was like in the 80s on the cusp of growth not quite there yet but almost at it however there was one element of it all that we we discussed would play a crucial part in this growth and that is this animal spirit this mythical spirit that everyone keeps talking about how do we get there with me is someone who is pretty much the doyen of telangana and hyderabad's startup ecosystem i'm pleased to well, uh, to introduce once again to you Mr Srinivas Rao Mahakali a big round of applause ladies and gentlemen for the CEO of T Hub MSR as he's more fondly known to people who work closely to him always a pleasure speaking with you and my first question to you any time we talk about the animal spirit the first thought that normally comes to mind is of startups but the fact remains that larger enterprises too have a whole lot of digital transformation to achieve and more importantly i think tihub also has a provision for that by way of your solution accelerator msr let me start by asking you to tell me how that helps and more importantly what kind of a difference does this external support make uh, in helping large corporates make that paradigm shift so first of all jude it's always pleasure to talk to you and uh, thank you for having me here so let me just step back a bit and before i get to your question right so when you think of any large entrepreneurial ecosystem right and obviously the one most of us would kind of think about is what got built in silicon valley to start with right uh, close to about 60 years ago first the first se semiconductor companies you know companies like fairchild intel ti etc right got together and it was a combination of government industry mm -hmm. academia getting together and building right so when you think about an entrepreneurial ecosystem Uh, and i'm also very inspired by a professor from babson a gentleman called uh, dan eisenberg so mm -hmm. who's built you know and studied entrepreneurial ecosystems across the world so he talks about you know what makes for a good entrepreneurial ecosystem mm -hmm. so obviously startups are at the front and center of everything second is obviously large companies mm -hmm. okay so large companies essentially in in terms of collaborating with startups and building open innovation ecosystems which i'll talk about at a little length once i get to the other components right. of the ecosystem so we have startups we have large companies we have obviously government and government policy uh, we have funding mm -hmm. right be it debt equity or other forms of uh, you know financing growth uh, we need to have academia involved we need to have policy uh, i mean uh, the media involved right so this is what makes for on a uh, really world class entrepreneurial ecosystem which is what we are trying to build here right right so when you think about corporates and startups so when you think about corporates today you know many of our companies have scaled uh, i am happy to see sadish reddy garu here they built a world class uh, pharma company from here and i'm sure there are many other world class companies Absolutely. among the audience here so they have essentially leveraged research and then built mm -hmm. and so on 
Now, when you are a large corporate, right, uh, you have really three choices on, on how you do things. One is either you build it within, okay, or you buy it, okay, you work with other large companies and this thing. Or the third is partnering, right? And which is where what we are trying to do at T-Hub, mm -hmm. okay, is about partnership. So when a large company works with a set of young, nimble, agile startups, mm -hmm. right? So some of the challenges a large company would have, right? You know, the silos, sometimes the inertia, sometimes the priorities, etc., may not allow the large company to be as nimble-footed as a startup, for example, right? So how do you leverage the, you know, the, the boldness, uh, the audacity of these startups and build an open innovation ecosystem is what we are doing, right? So large companies today can benefit by working with smaller companies right. and solve either problems which are extremely critical. So for example, today everyone is talking about generative AI, right? And what's the likely impact generative AI could have across all their businesses. Mm -hmm. And there are, for example, just last week uh, at T-Hub, uh, we inaugurated a Department of Science and Tech funded AI ML Center of Excellence. We already have 62 startups in the Gen AI space working on a range of problems. So for example, uh, since we are at a banking event, uh, Prashant Garu talked about innovation, etc. So one part of what we talk about the whole AI piece is this whole, you know, chat GPT and, uh, you know, co-pilot and Gemini and so on. Mm -hmm. But there's also treasure troves of information within a large company. Right. Absolutely. So there are companies which are building, our startups building what we call uh, private GPTs. And I understand this, this, this collaborative element of what you do at T-Hub, I'm sure, is pretty much the cornerstone of your raison d'etre, the reason for your existence itself. But I'm curious, how do you incentivize and how do you make these partnerships actually happen uh, in, in order to forge the collaboration that then happens henceforth? And more importantly, when these large companies come in, um, how forthcoming are they when it comes to possibly sharing tricks of the trade or trade secrets with the cohort of startups that they then come into contact with? Sure. So I'll uh, take two examples, I think, uh, Joe, to kind of illustrate the point. So one of the things in Hyderabad, we are in Hyderabad, so obviously we try and take advantage of the ecosystem which has got built here. So we have at this point of time close to about 320 global capability centers in Hyderabad, mm -hmm. right? So we have large entities, uh, you know, for example, in the banking and financial services space, companies like Wells Fargo, Bank of America, UBS, DBS, and so on, mm -hmm. right? And uh, one of the things which all these capability centers are now focused on, originally they were set up to take care of, you know, India has a large talent pool, it's cheaper to do business here, you know, arbitrage and so on. But now all of them are today, many of them, for example, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, have their largest centers outside of their parent headquarters mm -hmm. here in Hyderabad, right? So they are now looking at seeing how can they become more and more relevant to the, to the corporation back home and one way of doing it is by creating innovative solutions which are being built here and being built for the world. Mm -hmm. right? So that's how they reach out to us. No doubt. And the yeah. genesis of GCCs is no doubt part of the success story that yeah. Indian companies have embarked on, Correct. especially making tailor-made solutions for the kind of Correct. work that goes on here. Yeah. But, you know, I'm very curious. Telangana saw an election not even a year ago, if I'm not mistaken, merely a few months ago, and the government actually changed. Three, three months ago. Three months ago. It's, uh, we're still having a new government here. How does T-Hub ensure policy continuity, uh, the politics of change all around it notwithstanding? Because it goes without saying that any digital transformation, any framework for this will require some element of continuity on the policy front despite changing politics. How do you do it? So sure, first of all, I think, uh, you know, we are in Hyderabad and, you know, what I'm going to say will resonate with many. So I think one of the things which we've seen, right, so if you think about, if you look at uh, what happened in Hyderabad, Right. The first seeds of IT were sown back in the early 90s. So we have this iconic building in high-tech city, which was the first building. And then the first large company which came to Hyderabad from outside was Microsoft. Right. And I think our policymakers, despite you know, changes of government, we've had three or four changes of government, three or four changes of parties, all of them, I think, recognize that we'll grow better 
by standing on the shoulders of others, mm -hmm. right? So I think, and also the, the government which took over th three months ago has repeatedly emphasized the need to, to accelerate what has been done, right? Uh, keep doing, building on the good work, the foundation which has been laid and scale it to the next level by doing things faster, right? right? So I think uh, so far every indication is there will be continuity of policy. Mm -hmm. And also remember, particularly from an IT standpoint, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in Telangana, in Hyderabad, uh, obviously IT and real estate are very closely linked. And uh, given all the infrastructure which you see, mm -hmm. uh, there's no reason for any disruption to be, you know, to be thought of. And that can only come as good news to the cohort of startups that not only come under your wing, but, the fa but, but many that are upcoming, especially for you know, the machine learning and AI tech lab that you've just uh, launched a week ago. You know, but I'm just curious, MSR. The fact remains, and I'm sure many would agree with me here, the role of innovation, no doubt, is to make lives better. You know, but when it comes to actually going about selecting startups or selecting ideas for innovation, irrespective of whether they, they're born from a startup or a large enterprise, what are the metrics that you at T-Hub apply to that process and that decision? Um, is it more of commercial viability at this time and place, or do you lean more towards, it's a great idea, its time may not have come yet, but there's a lot more exploration to go, even though commercial viability isn't exactly a given in the near term. Which way do you sway while making that decision to pick one for collaboration? So, so Jude, do you want a long answer or a short answer? <laughs> Give me a short one because I'm sure we have many more okay. talking so points I talk to about this, right? So again, when you think about, think about how, how to look at this. So for our focus at T-Hub and what most of us, we are now 70 plus incubators mm -hmm. in, uh, in Hyderabad, is obviously we work with companies from stage zero to a pre-series A funding round yes. is what we typically focus at. Plenty of early so stage startups. Yeah, early stage, very early stage right. startups. And again, now, increasingly, now we have about 120,000 startups in India. Mm -hmm. We have 7,500 startups in Telangana, right? And now you'll hear people talk about this thing called deep tech startups. Mm -hmm. There are approximately around seven to 8,000 deep tech startups type of thing. So now if you look at what that means. So at a very early stage, uh, what we look for is, first of all, what is the problem they're trying to solve, mm -hmm. okay? And is that a problem? If they solve that problem, can they build a truly scaled business, right? Will the, if they solve that problem, will it impact a large number of businesses? And will it also potentially impact a large number of people, one. Second is, what is the solution they've thought of, right? Uh, is it a, you know, first of all, if it is a me too solution that, you know, me too mm. problem, for example, raid hailing is an example, right? So today, I mean, I can tell you uh, that there are about a six or seven companies now which are wanting to get into the raid hailing business mm -hmm. here in Hyderabad. So unless they can come out with a really differentiated value proposition, mm -hmm. right, uh, which benefits all stakeholders concerned, they are unlikely to be successful. Right. So what is the problem? What is the solution? Uh, the quality of the founding team, Mm -hmm. right? Which is in terms of why do we think or why do they think they'll be the guys who can really build a you know, scalable business mm -hmm. is what we look for. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, if there's any evidence of some traction, right? If there's, let's say, even a couple of customers who've actually paid, put money where their mouth is and mm -hmm. actually given them some work right. for a, in a commercial transaction, mm -hmm. that's validation. Right. Right. So typically at a very early stage, it's really the problem they are solving. Mm -hmm. Is it a large addressable market if they solve it? Mm -hmm. Third is what is the solution they've tried to build, mm -hmm. right? How differentiated is the solution likely to be? And do, 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 does everyone around the table, them and us, mm -hmm. think that that team has the you know, gumption and the guts to pull this off? Okay, all right. So, of course, commercial viability is important, but it isn't, nobody's in a hurry to get there, at least in the no, early you can, stages. you can put a, run up a set of numbers on Excel, all right. but, you know, <laughs> when the rubber hits the road, you'll know whether right. they'll be able to. You know, another thing that really strikes me about T-Hub is the fact that at its front and center when it comes to the PPP board is, of course, Academia. And given the fact that you've constructed and curated the processes, uh, you know, around institutes like um, IIT, Nalsar, and ISB, it reminds me very much about what happened in Silicon Valley a few years ago, uh, where much of the infrastructure and you know, partnerships there were built around Stanford, the University of Berkeley. Um, how, what kind of incentive 
do you propose or do you have to kind of take academic partnership to the next level really as far as T-Hub is concerned and actually go about incentivizing it uh, for more of this to happen at T-Hub itself? Sure. So I think uh, specifically with reference to the three partners and in fact this morning uh, we signed an engagement with ASCII, the mm -hmm. Administrative Staff College of India, mm -hmm. which is a government run entity. So I think more and more academicians are clearly focused on building out innovation, mm -hmm. right? And where we can play a role is, uh, you know, I'm going to take refuge in an equation. So when you think about innovation, right, innovation is idea into commercialization, right? When you finally distill it down. Mm -hmm. So what we are trying to see is how some of the ideas which are getting, you know, you know incubated in some of these centers of learning, mm -hmm. how can they be commercialized? Right. And what can we do? You know, collectively working together. Mm -hmm. So it works two ways, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, for many of our startups in deep tech, so for example, we have a bunch of startups in the mobility space, mm -hmm. right? So for example, in triple IT, there is a, an autonom uh, autonomous, uh, you know, uh, something called Thihan, which right. is the center for autonomous variability. Mm -hmm. Our startups benefit hugely mm -hmm. from access to their labs, mm -hmm from access to their subject matter experts, mm -hmm. and just the ability to bounce off ideas. All right. Right? So. so very interesting. But you know, MSR, I can't let you go without asking you one last question. $1.9 billion in funding is what you've secured in the last eight years of your existence at T-Hub. $1.9 billion more, you told me just last week, uh, in the next five years is what you're targeting. What lessons do you think India can take in terms of the T-Hub template itself? in the country's march to a $10 trillion economy by 2030? Sure, so first is, uh, I think, uh, the power of public-private partnerships, mm -hmm. right? When you get a bunch of people working together who come from industry, mm -hmm. academia, right, and government, one. Second is you create an institution which has, we are a Section 8 not-for-profit company, mm -hmm. uh, but we are run pretty much like a for-profit company. Mm -hmm. So we bring in people from the private sector or mm -hmm. from the government. Mm -hmm. Uh, everything is by merit, right? And uh, you bring people who've been there and done that. So people who've been entrepreneurs themselves obviously are probably in the best position to work with fellow entrepreneurs and support them, etc. So create a structure where you have autonomy. Second is make sure that the institution is self-sustaining. Self mm -hmm. So for example, today we don't require any funding from the government from an operational perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, we we generate our own cash flows. Mm -hmm. CapEx is done by the government, mm -hmm. but operationally we generate our own cash flows. Mm -hmm. And the third is bringing the right people to run it. Mm -hmm. And this is a model which obviously we are working with a few other states. All right. Replicate. All right. Well, there you have it. Collaboration, sustenance, and really unleashing the animal spirit could well be the way to go. You couldn't have put it any better. Srinivas Ramahakali, as always, a pleasure speaking to you. A wide round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for those insights on T-Hub and taking innovation forward. Thank you very much, Thank MSR. You. May I please request you to stay back on stage for a moment, just for a moment. It's time for some felicitations. May I uh, request Mr. Prashant Kumar to please come up on stage and felicitate sir with a souvenir courtesy of Yes Bank Private and Thank you, Jude. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we're talking about the dynamic landscape of global economics and, of course, India's growth stands as a show of resilience, uh, innovation, and strategic vision. Now, what are we going to do in the next session? We will delve deep into the heart of innovation as we unravel the strategies, technologies, and collaborative efforts. So without further ado, we are now going to jump on our next fireside for which may I please first welcome on stage uh, Ekta Batra from CNBC TV 18. And for this very exciting conversation, we now have Mr. Satish Reddy with us, Chairman Dr. Reddy's laboratories on the theme inside the laboratory of India's $10 trillion dream. Thank you.
good evening good evening everybody uh, everybody nobody needs uh, you know an introduction for mr reddy of dr reddy's but i just want to give a sense in terms of what we are discussing today we all know that india is known as the pharmacy of the world it's the largest provider of generic medicines globally having grown 9.43% cagr in the past 9 years india is responsible for 20% of the global supply of drugs contributes to 60% of the global vaccines in the in the world the country has the highest number of us ft approved plants outside of the us the current size of the pharma industry is 50 billion dollars with an equal contribution from both exports as well as the domestic market the aim of the pharma industry which contributes to around 2% of india's gdp and 8% of exports is to grow to 65 billion by 2024 and 130 billion by 2030 to a further 500 billion by 2047 so how does the indian pharma industry grow to this size and contribute successfully to india's vision of becoming a 10 trillion dollar economy mr reddy thank you very much for joining in Well, we've spoken about these targets before, 130 billion dollars in terms of getting there. How do you think we'll get there, and what is innovation? How big a role is innovation going to play to get to that mark? Sure. Thank you, Ekta, and uh, thank you to CNBC as well as Yes Bank for inviting me to this uh, growth summit. Um, 130 billion dollars is a target that uh, you know we had done after a lot of study. Uh, you know, by 2030. because currently we said we have 50 billion dollars we want to go up to uh, 130 billion dollars so different different elements to it and your specific question is how do we use innovation to get there it's it's very critical let me put it that way because if we take the normal rate of growth it will only take us to a certain extent maybe 70 80 billion dollars that's that's about it you know if you take 7 to 9% of growth uh, you know the which the industry currently enjoys but then if you want to get to 130 billion dollars you have to create more value the, all the numbers that you uh, put it out there in terms of volumes right so whether it's one in three medicines in the us generics coming in from indian pharmaceutical companies or if it's one in four in the uk or even the vaccines that you talked about all these are volume led kind of growth so it's important to shift the lens also towards creating more value and that's where innovation plays an important role and again there are different layers to it and the critical thing in that would be especially at the high end because if you see two thirds of the uh, you know uh, world pharma market it all comes from innovation the innovative drugs the originally discovered uh, molecules and uh, if you see it from that order uh, india is just uh, you know getting started uh, you know in that space because i mean of course there are companies including like ours uh, which have been in this for the last 30 years but it also shows you that it's it's a highly investment intensive intensive it's also risky uh, very uncertain in the, in the way to we go about it but in terms of the value that can create just one molecule if you're successful can completely transform the company mm -hmm. so in terms of value creation that becomes that much more critical so it plays a very important role there okay but uh, do you think that we've made inroads into r&d and the reason i ask is just in the past couple of months we've heard positive news from orchid pharma where there is a uti drug which has been approved by the us fda it's a new approved drug it was out licensed out licensed to a company we have news from immuno act which is received which is uh, developed a car t therapy much cheaper than what is available and even tata uh, has you know invented a chemo drug which costs 100 rupees it's still to go into tr human trials but is expected to be effective for chemotherapy and reoccurrence of cancer do you think that we are making small inroads no certainly we are making progress uh, right because the, the examples that you talked about i mean especially that's something to be proud of uh, the a uh, drug that you talked about uh, for UTI uh, which came from orchid pharma so this this was something in the works for a very long time but you know they licensed it out and then uh, the clinical trials that were done it got the US FDA approval yeah. right so it it's gone through the hoops yeah. in terms of what can be done and it will be in the market so lot of slabs again uh, sorry uh, the immune act is is an example that you uh, took it, it, it's it's something really commendable uh, you know because it it it, it was an incubated uh, firm from the IIT uh pro uh, dr uh, rahul purwar uh, you know so for the first carti therapy in india which got approved you know it's a significant milestone in terms of you know what what can happen in the pharmaceutical technology and the medicines that can be made available so certainly these these these, these are steps to be done but i think we have to get into a larger uh, debate about you know the capabilities that have been built up over the years i mean let, let me also just take a minute to also explain the historical perspective because for a very long time 
right, until the, when the 1970 Patents Act was passed, you know, it, it, it was more about process patents and not product patents. So that culture of innovation was not there in the country. Mm. It was about, you know, coming out with more affordable medicines, uh, you know, products discovered elsewhere, and then making it to India. But then when, uh, you know, the patent laws came in, uh, you know, and it started getting implemented in 2005, that's when there are some companies like Dr. Reddy's, which, which got into the game much ahead of the game. And then there were people chasing the targets anyway. It requires huge amount of resources. But the key thing here is, again, in terms of our revenues and profits, it's a generic company. Mm -hmm. And you know the generic uh, market. It's a very competitive thing in whichever markets where, where we compete. In such a situation, to say that, you know, it's like we'll take the highest risk and also put all our resources behind, you know, discovering drugs, that's going to be difficult, and that's a journey we've also gone through. There was a time when, uh, you know, we were spending at our peak 14% of sales, and when the innovator product failed, uh, you know, in the last stages of clinical trials, we were punished extensively uh, by the market in those days, you know, talking about early 2000s uh, at that time. So in terms of exactly how do companies fund it, in terms of, you know, the whole ecosystem that needs to develop, there are lots more things, but we can talk about that. Absolutely. I think that's critical, that you were punished because your drug failed. But the point is that that's how innovation happens. We don't know that, but in the U.S., South Korea, Israel, uh, that's exactly how the drugs actually reach the end stage. Maybe 10 uh, reach the end stage out of 100 which are under development. But the point is we need the government support to encourage that R&D. For example, Israel and South Korea have a high amount of GDP spend on R&D, I think around 4% of their sales as compared to maybe around 0.7% uh, in India. What does the government need to do to encourage R&D and innovation in the country? Lots. So, I mean, just to clarify on the, when I say the market, uh, the, we got punished. Again, see, the, the issue is about, you know, we are a generic uh, company. We're investing heavily into, uh, you know, R&D at that point of time, a disproportionate amount mm -hmm. without much revenue. Mm -hmm. That's what the investors punished us for. So we became a bit more cautious, right? Uh, the, so that's why we completely changed the model. Uh, we started a wholly owned uh, subsidiary, located it differently uh, in Bangalore, did services for innovators, and also did our own programs, and now it's Origin Oncology, mm -hmm. which, which continues this path of uh, uh, discovery. So I was talking more about that, but then when it comes to the government, uh, lots of things needed to be done because the examples that you gave, uh, you know, in, in most of the countries, again, they started pretty late. Uh, right, uh, in terms of discovery, uh, leave the U.S. out because, I mean, there was always something, uh, the, you know, all of us can learn from the U.S., but it's a very matured, uh, uh, you know, R&D ecosystem at uh, that point. But if you if take some of the countries, right, so let, let's take, you know, one by one, let, let's take the funding part. You know, we're, we're, we're again, when we say government needs to pitch in, it's not that the government does not promote research in this country, but if you see the numbers... And also, if you see the way it's being implemented, and they, I think it's, it's more that needs to be done. I mean, just to put it in a nutshell, what is important is that amount of investment by the government has to increase substantially, where it becomes more of a direct investment, uh, you know, which, which encourages, uh, you know, R&D to happen in this country. For example, you would have various schemes under DST, BIRAC, DBT, you know, but then when it comes to, uh, you know, what translates finally into commercial products, I think that's the thing that we are asking for. Right? So if you're looking at startups, for example, what kind of a funding are they getting? Yes, they do get funds from BIRAC, DST, DBT, but the kind of research that they do because of the uncertainty that we're talking about. You said the failures rate, rate is extremely high. I mean, these people need some certainty because they are scientists who have gotten into this game and they would require some kind of certainty. So direct government participation on one side. And also if you see the private sector investment, it, it's very low. Mm -hmm. And to catalyze that, that's where you need models like what you see in Israel where there's a joint development fund where the government also pitched in because what happens with especially VC system to develop, uh, they, they like to take, they, they get into more of late stage kind of thing. So for them to get into early stage because it's higher risk mm -hmm. by definition, they would like to see some level of you know, mitigation of risks by this kind of a support. Mm -hmm. So that could be another kind of a fund that could be looked at. And also if you see, you know, in terms of incentives, because this is something that, uh, uh, you know, has been withdrawn right, uh, for the industry, but the weighted deduction which we had for a very long time, uh, especially for R&D, that's, that's been taken out. And as for companies to take more risk, you know, so to encourage the whole ecosystem, it, it requires, uh, you know, these kind of incentives, whether it's in the form of tax credits, whether it's in terms of patent box, uh, whether it's in terms of, uh, you know, some kind of uh, uh, tax credits that we can take. There, there, there are a whole lot of things which can be done. 
uh, which would encourage this uh, more and more people to take this risk and get into innovation. So, so for, risk taking is required. So for funding, private funding such as venture capitalists, uh, you need to encourage or create an ecosystem in India where they come into the early stage because of our R&D pipeline, pipeline being in a nascent stage. Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, well, let's move on and talk about where India is when it comes to being a CDMO player, when it comes to innovation. We not, might not be creating the molecule at this point in time, but we are participating in the creation of that molecule very substantially. Uh, how important is that piece as an emerging s sector for India? And how well are we doing, say, compared to uh, other countries such as China and South Korea? Sure. No, they, that's, that's a business that's been around for quite some time, uh, you know, in terms of pharmaceutical services that we can offer. And again, it's, it's, it's at different levels. It can be from off-patent APIs, but I think your question is more towards innovator products and, you know, what kind of services we do. There are companies doing this work, right? So, but in terms of, you know, the level at which we could go to uh, from what the innovators require and what India can deliver, I think it's, it's a huge opportunity, and especially in the big target that we're talking about, this can also form, uh, you know, a decent uh, chunk uh, in terms of aiding the growth uh, to get there. Uh, again, important thing is also changing technologies, you know, because, you know, the pipeline of most of the new products coming out are mostly biologics at this point of time. Yeah. You know, almost two-thirds of the new pipeline is biologics. So CDMO suited towards biologics, that's required. Okay. Not too many in India at this point of time, and, but there are people, including Dr. Eddies, investing into this uh, area. But it gives a huge opportunity because you said China. So in terms of the scale, that's the other aspect, right? In terms of scale, there are Chinese companies who have built huge capabilities and also facilities, mm. uh, you know, where they were in the forefront at some point of time. Mm. There is an opportunity for India now because there are innovator companies now wanting to look at India very closely because of the capabilities that we have and also for them to diversify away from China, uh, that presents a very, very interesting opportunity for companies to take advantage of. Okay, so maybe China plus one is actually turning out to be an opportunity. Uh, how should Indian companies participate in the growth story? Do you think that maybe there could be more in-licensing of molecules, out-licensing of molecules as we saw to probably mitigate the risk as well? Mix of both, right? So uh, when you talk about outlicensing, that, that's something in our early stages of discovery. We had uh, followed that model because obviously we could not afford the clinical trials because that's this big component. Again, I'm talking about original discovery. So it, we are at a stage where we can afford part of it. So that, that's how we are taking it. But at some point of time, we have to outlicense, especially when it comes to phase three and, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, large patient uh, the trial globally. Uh, you know, if you have to do a clinical trial, it requires that much of investment which companies can't afford uh, by themselves at this point of time. So out-licensing is, is a model that, that would happen. Having said that, there is also in-licensing, which again, uh, you know, companies have done, especially in the, today's world, because there are major developments happening in technology, mm -hmm. especially if you take, for example, oncology, uh, you know, especially through cell and gene therapy, there's a lot of developments that took place in terms of the products that are being, uh, uh, you know, the, the, that outside of India, uh, you know, for them to be launched in India, multinationals have this opportunity to partner with companies like us who are very deeply entrenched in the market mm. where they would license the product to us and then we can market it. Yeah. Example would be Amgen, for example, almost 10 years back, uh, you know, some of their oncology products, we licensed it from Amgen mm. and then we are able to, uh, you know, provide it uh, to the Indian market. Okay. What about innovating for India? Because we have so many tropical diseases. We have dengue, chikungunya, leprosy, elephantitis, and there are no, uh, you know, solutions for those. Should Indian companies concentrate more on India-specific diseases, or is there no money in it? I mean, the commercial part is, is one aspect. I mean, I wouldn't say, talk about the money part of it, because these are really, you know, I would classify them more as public health issues. Uh, you know, the, the kind of diseases that you t talked about specific to India. So here again, I think there are collaborative models that can be used and we can find solutions because the important thing is to find uh, solutions and pharma companies should not shy away from it mm -hmm. nor um, get into it because it's, it's not economically, economically viable. That I don't think is, is the right thing to do. And several companies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for that matter, have gotten into this. Lupin in TB, for example, or whether it is, uh, you know, our company collaborating, uh, uh, you know, in a partnership with the Dr. Edis Institute of Life Sciences and the Welcome uh, DBT Alliance. Uh, you know, so we, we also got into uh, the, that area. So there's several models by which this can be done. Uh, it is not something to be neglected. It's something which, let me put it this way, the government is also taking it very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. And especially after COVID, 
lot of programs have come out, uh, you know, which call for a very collaborative framework by which this can be done. You know, okay. so it's not to be ignored. All right. Uh, well, just before we wrap up, just a quick brief thought, uh, Mr. Reddy, because you, the company turned 40 years this year. It is also election year. Give us a vision for the company in terms of what we can expect from Dr. Reddy's, say, in the next uh, 10 years, as well as any thoughts in terms of how business is probably going to perform, considering that it is election year. Sure. So I think as far as the company is concerned, like you said, it's, it's a big milestone, four decades of the company. We were incorporated in uh, uh, February, so last month we turned 40. It, it, it's, a, it's been a fascinating journey, right? It's not uh, that, you know, it's like everything was a success. We had our ups and downs. But in terms of what we built, that's something all of us at Dr. Reddy's are extremely proud of because uh, we started off as an API company. Hyderabad was the hub for, uh, you know, they keep calling it the bulk drug capital but if you see the active pharmaceutical ingredients, Hyderabad was the hub. So having started in that journey and then gotten into, you know, finished dosage formulations for India, invested into drug discovery very early in the life cycle, uh, once liberalization started to also get into emerging markets, starting with Russia in those days, you know, and all these things were not easy. But, but in terms of, you know, our early success, because we were the first to do it in several things, whether it was launching products for the first time in the country in finished dosage uh, in India, while it, the uh, patent uh, act was still about process patent, a lot of products from me, uh, a lot of products launched for the first time uh, from Dr. Reddy's. When it came to discovery, to get into original discovery as early as 1992, it was one of the first private sector companies to have done that. To be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, we continue to be, and uh, you know, outside of uh, uh, Japan, the only Asia-Pacific uh, company to be uh, listed on NYC, continues to be Dr. Reddy's. And lots of other things. I won't go, go through all those successes, but we've also had our fair share of failures. I talked about our uh, failure in discovery in a very prolific area at that point of time. You know, and the, because we had licensed molecules to uh, Node, Nondesk, and uh, uh, Novartis at the time, that failure was a disappointment, but we moved on, and then I talked about origin oncology. So it's, it's been a fascinating journey in terms of where we are heading to. There's several things to come up because we, the, the theme was about innovation. That's, that's a big thing in Dr. Reddy's, yeah. right? So whether it is, uh, you know, new products that we in-license, the, the discovery part of it, or uh, if it's, uh, you know, also to do with, uh, you know, differentiated formulations, for example, to take it to emerging markets and also to regulated markets, there's a huge lot of work to be done. A lot of adjacencies, nutraceuticals, for example, uh, OTC as, as a segment, there are plenty of things to be done, and the action is still unfolding. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Reddy. Thank you very much for joining in and giving us your thoughts on innovation, especially in the pharmaceutical space. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful discussion. Uh, may I request uh, now Mr. Kumar to please come up on stage and... Uh, Felicitate him with a souvenir courtesy. Yes, private and CMTC to be Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, moving on, ladies and gentlemen, in an era where dynamic shifts in the global landscape are redefining economic powerhouses, India is drawing the attention of investors and visionaries alike. In the upcoming panel discussion, we will aim to explore India's journey towards achieving global competitiveness through innovation and robust production uh, capabilities. And in a rapidly evolving global landscape, India stands poised to leverage its immense potential and emerge as a key player on the world stage. To moderate the session, may I please invite back on stage Ekta Batra from CNBC 18. And uh, may I now also invite all the panelists. Put your hands together for Dr. Sai Prasad, Executive Director, BVIL and Chairman, CII Telangana. Mr. Anurag Malapati, promoter, Leap India Food and Logistics Private Limited. Pavan Jain, director of finance, Kirby Building Systems, India and Southeast Asia. And Naveen Gulapali, global head, corporate centers and business solution, Novartis.
Well, Steve Jobs famously remarked that innovation is the hallmark of leadership, setting apart leaders from followers. Today, we find ourselves in Hyderabad, a burgeoning hub for industries ranging from IT to pharmaceuticals and a nurturing ground for startups. Hyderabad boasts numerous global capability and R&D centers for leading companies across various sectors. Efforts to foster innovation include the establishment of over 20 incubation centers specializing in health tech and med tech. Recognizing the need to bridge gaps in the innovation ecosystem, the government has introduced in initiatives like the Research and Innovation Circle of Hyderabad, aimed at connecting research institutions, academia, industry players, and investors. At a national level, India has shown commendable progress in R&D and innovation, which is evidenced by a significant 31% increase in patent applications in 2022, one of the highest globally. Additionally, India has doubled its R&D expenditure in the past decade. However, despite these strides, India's R&D spend is relatively low as compared to the global average. It's at 0.7% versus the global average at 1.7%. The pressing question remains, how can we encourage Indian companies, which have historically allocated a mere 1% of their total expenditure to R&D over the past decade to ramp up investments in this crucial area? This evening, our discussion revolves around Innovate, Produce, Thrive, India's path to global competitiveness competitiveness. We have a huge range of panelists this evening. So I'm going to start uh, by asking Mr. Sai Prasad um, about his thoughts, uh, you know, his thoughts on innovation. Uh, welcome to the show. Are you seeing a big shift when it comes to, say, the perception about India as an innovation hub? The reason I ask is that, you know, earlier work came to India for cost optimization, arbitrage, but now, a lot of it is probably to do with India's talent pool across sectors. We are talking about global capability centers, R&D centers. Uh, is that shift tangible, and is it taking place currently? Sure. Thank you, uh, Yes Bank, and thank you, uh, CNBC, for having us here. Uh, it's a honor and a pleasure. Um, I just listened to uh, Mr. Satish Reddy from uh, Dr. Reddy's. Um, you know, they're part of the pharmaceutical industry. And we at Bharat Biotech are also part of the pharmaceutical industry, but we are a small subset called vaccines. So uh, the business model and the business profile in vaccines, I would say, is completely different than what the uh, large pharma industry in India follows. We follow a pathway of innovation. We follow a pathway of product development. Uh, we follow a pathway of looking at public health factors, not just in India, but other parts of the developing world. Uh, maybe we're not as focused as high-income countries uh, like U.S. and Europe. We're focused more on middle-income countries and low-income countries, but we're focused on infectious diseases. And we have already proven in our, I mean, we are 25 years old as a company. We've proven that we can demonstrate innovation and product development over an extended period of time. So we've had products and projects in our company for over 15 or 20 years like a rotavirus vaccine or a typhoid conjugate vaccine that we have developed over a long period of time, and then they're in the market today in over 80 countries around the world. So we've shown that. And th that, those products are not just a Me Too or a copycat generic. We actually have to do phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, and also uh, conduct product life cycle management studies for safety and effectiveness post licensure. So we've done that, we've shown that, and in the future, that pipeline of innovation and in R&D is continuing with products for cholera, malaria, TB, and chikungunya. So I think we have shown how to do R&D uh, for innovative products which don't exist in any other part of the world. Um, and we've also shown that we can take, take up public health challenges and develop new vaccines and innovate new vaccines. Okay, all right. So um, that's from Bharat Biotech. But uh, Naveen, you know, I wanted to get your thoughts with regards to the shift that we're seeing when it comes to the perception about India as an innovation hub. And uh, the fact that there's so much, so many R&D centers, in fact, being set up in Hyderabad itself. Yeah, thanks. Um, really pleased to be here. So I represent Novartis, one of the uh, most innovative uh, healthcare companies in the world. And clearly, there's a definite theme uh, and preference for healthcare companies here, which is nice to see. Um, so, so 
the, you mentioned capability centers, uh, and it's really nice to also see that capability centers have become mainstream. Uh, I've been in this space for 20 years. Novartis has been here for 12 years. And it's really difficult for us to explain what we do in India uh, relative to the global uh, organization. But I think it's now um, probably very evident that India brings to the table a lot of skills. Uh, any of the Novartis leaders will tell us that we're in India because we think for the next 25 years, this is where we can find the best talent, be it science, be it technology, be it technical knowledge, and be it digital, uh, coupled with a, a massive demographic advantage of really young people uh, who, have, who bring all this knowledge together and are also then able to bring uh, transformation uh, into a larger organizations. Because in India, technology is really transforming a lot uh, of how we live, how we work, how we engage, et cetera. So this digitally native uh, population brings a lot of uh, innovation, transformation, energy into the company. So the perception has completely changed. And today, in organizations like ours, and we have more than 10% of our global headcount based in Hyderabad, right here. Okay. That's actually interesting. You mentioned that, you know, a lot of people don't know what uh, you all do in Hyderabad. So I'm going to ask you because Novartis's operation center, which is the largest of six centers in the world, is present in Hyderabad. Uh, what is the advantage that Novartis gets specifically from India and from Hyderabad? And what does that center do? Yeah. So, so with nearly 10% of the company, we operate in almost all areas of the organization. Um, so we have... Uh, some support for research, but a lot of drug development uh, teams are based here. A lot of the teams that support our marketing and sales and operations are based here. This is in addition to uh, the labs. We have labs in Genome Valley that do technical research and development. And finally, we have the usual functions that most uh, capability centers have, which is technology, finance, uh, and so, so many other processes. So we have a whole sea of operations. This is one location where you can actually see the whole company uh, in office working together. Um, that's what uh, we have in the capability center here. Okay. Well, I'm just going to ask you about an MNC's perspective in India because you have a, glo uh, you have a global center in Hyderabad, but a lot of the MNC's are actually reducing their feet on the ground in India. And Novartis is, you know, looking at its uh, strategic options as well. Uh, in that context, is India just going to be an outsourcing hub and MNCs don't actually want to distribute their drugs on the ground or make that investment in people? They want to probably cut back on that and send uh, and probably tie up with an Indian company which has more of a reach. No, absolutely uh, not really. So in, in India is a, I mean, a, a huge growth story that is very attractive for companies from many respect, right? So it's not only a massive demand for health and healthcare needs that exists, but also the, in the context of uh, uh, growth of India, right? So our people are our biggest asset, and we're able to bring a lot of value uh, t uh, into organizations. So many organizations are in India to really harness this component of our workforce for the benefit of global health, for the benefit of patients all around the world. As part of this process, a lot of technology comes in, a lot of know-how comes in, which again benefits the ecosystem. So we have partnerships with educational institutions. We help shape curriculum. We bring a lot of this knowledge that will again uh, apply back and benefit uh, the uh, Indian patients and Indian healthcare system. So in all aspects, uh, I think uh, it's, um, it's really uh, growth and expansion uh, that I see uh, ahead of us. Okay. Well, Anurag, uh, you know, your focus is agri-infrastructure, making sure that uh, India has more efficient grain storage. How is innovation being effectively used in that sector for a country such as India? Right. So, thank you, first of all. It's a pleasure to be here. So what we do at Leap India is we help the government of India modernize its food storage infrastructure. So traditionally, grain has been handled in bags and stored in warehouses. Now that has been modernized or is being modernized. So the government is moving from bag to bulk. And food storage silos is one of the key enablers there. So if you look at tech in food storage, traditionally there has been no tech. 
Grain was procured, stored forever for six months, for a year in a warehouse. There's no proper way to fumigate. But now if you look at all the new tech and innovation coming in, the grain that we store in these food silos, food storage silos are monitored on an hourly basis, on a minute to minute basis wherein we make sure that there's proper aeration, proper fumigation that takes place. There is CADAS that has been implemented into this, and now the government of India has implemented something called as Depot Online System, wherein all the warehouses and silos are totally connected to a centralized system, wherein the government today knows what kind of grain is available where, what consumption happens where. So tech actually helps the Food Corporation of India, in my opinion, benefit a lot real time when it comes to making sure that grain is accessible to people. Because imagine this, like India feeds almost a billion people every year, right, under the Food Security Act. Imagine grain not being available in a district for two or three days. That would be chaos, right? So tech plays a very key role there. Okay. Well, one of the key points about your industry in specific would be scalable solutions. Uh, when it comes to innovation. How difficult is it to get a scalable solution uh, when it comes to R&D? So if you look at R&D, right, it's a continuous process like what Mr. Sai Prasad just said. Their process of R&D is throughout, and it's a continuous process. So for any tech company also, I think it's the same. And when it comes to scalable solution in my sector, I think, look, uh, Again, the number I just mentioned, India feeds about a billion people. That's a lot of scale, right? And uh, the government only procures maybe 35% of food grain directly. Still 65% is being handled by the open market where storage is a big potential. So a lot of these solutions will play a key and an important role there. And I think there's a lot of room for scalable solutions here. And if you benchmark us to countries like Canada and America, Tech has played a very scare, very, very critical low role in scalability and storage. And what are the biggest challenges that you probably face in your business because of the scalability? Because of? Because of the scalability. See, I think uh, ours is an infrastructure business, it's, so it's relatively straightforward, right? And uh, infrastructure is always big in scale and big in numbers. But when I see my other colleagues uh, who are in the agri-tech space, of course, if you look at... Uh, Agri-tech in India, it's mostly bought over by private companies and lesser by farmers or any of the producers, the, what you see in the West. So I think that is, I see as a challenge in India which has to evolve. Well, uh, Mr. Jain, you're also in the infrastructure space. You also have a center of engineering excellence which is present in Hyderabad. How does that center help you innovate within your sector of infrastructure? Thank you so much, Yes Bank and CNBC, for giving me this opportunity. This is privileged to be part of this event. And uh, before giving the answer of your question, let me just uh, start with the beginning of Mr. Prashant's remark about the vision of trend trillion economy, which is bound to be happened. Timing may be questionable, where we all are striking to achieve that target over a period of time. And coming to our part, actually. So let me give you some sort of uh, background of our company. This is also an infra-based company. But Prima Facie, it is one form of the construction, actually, pre-engineered steel building fabrication. And of course, uh, after doing the designing, fabrication, and installation of the site. So we are the pioneer of this concept in India. Two and a half decades back, somewhere in 2000, we have started our first operational facility in Hyderabad. Then eventually, over a period of last 25 years, we have expanded our presence in India in different, different states. Now we are operating with the three manufacturing units in India, Gujarat, Uttarakhand, and uh, Telangana. Over and ever, this is a multinational company, Middle East, Kuwait-based group. And uh, altogether, I can say, in this particular business group level, we are from last more or less five decades. We started this business in 1975. Uh, by acquisition from uh, America, uh, this company and technology. So this is really uh, exciting things and uh, initial years when we have entered into India, I can say there was a lot of struggle to, you know, uh, to teach the people what type of technology we are using for making the construction because generally people are used to of conventional construction like brick, cement, steel and all. But now I can say if you see a lot of turnaround it is happening. 
Eventually, a lot of players have also emerged along with us uh, in the last two and a half decades. They are also doing pretty well. And India, the industry itself, it has gone more or less 2 million ton steel fabrication over a period of time. And we'll see huge potential growth, specifically last two years post-COVID. We are expecting this industry should go 15% year-on-year basis for next five years. And uh, one more thing about Central of Excellency, we would like to see because of great talent available in India and competitiveness for entire global operation where we are operating in Middle East, India, as well as Southeast Asia. We have set up this uh, Central of Excellency here. Altogether, we have around 250 MTEX engineers who are working with us. And workforce-wise, with all these three plants, more or less 5,000 people, blue collar and white collar, directly employ with us. So definitely, I can say, uh, this is one of the concepts which is now very commonly known in the industry. And uh, I mean, along with us, so many other people have also emerged, but still we are dominating our market leadership in this business. Okay. We are growing 15% year on year. How much of that is probably going into R&D? R&D, basically, this is one of the part, actually, you know, our business is composite contract which consists of uh, engineering, fabrications as well as erection. So the bifurcation, it is very difficult to see because it is part of the package deal of composite. But I can say engineering is one of the basic element which is start from the quotation or inquiry of the particular project and that is a very key element for starting our business. So in terms of, uh, you know, percentage of our total value, it's difficult to prescribe it, but I can say it is instrumental for getting our business. Okay. All right. Uh, well, Mr. Prasad, you know, one of the key things is that uh, Bharat Biotech has obviously been at the forefront of innovation, uh, especially during COVID, and it taught us that innovation is possible on an expedited basis. So what can, what are the key learnings from that phase that we can take away for us to probably maybe expedite uh, R&D, and how is AI and ML probably playing a role in that as well? Uh, thank you. I think what, what is important for many of us to learn is that uh, I think most people around the world think that companies that were able to develop products during the pandemic were first-time novices that tried to do something and it became successful. The answer is these are entities, whether it's Pfizer or Moderna or us or any of the AstraZeneca, they had decades and decades of experience doing R&D, doing innovation, but failing at it many a times and learning from it. And that's what happened with us. Many of our other vaccines that we developed, some of them were successful, some of them were failures, but we learned from it. And when the pandemic hit, we you know, kind of knew exactly what to do, what are all the activities that we could do. What accelerated during the pandemic, obviously we committed a lot more uh, funding into our own internal R&D program for Covaxin. If you think about it, at that time, it was almost 40% of our revenues that we committed towards R&D very aggressively prior to funding from the government or any other international agency. So that was the risk that we took. It could have gone north, it could have gone south. Uh, luckily for us, it went north. But the perspective is that with that kind of funding, what we were able to do is that we were able to do thousands and thousands of experiments in parallel uh, without waiting for the results we would design the next set of experiments and that is something that we don't do in standard product development it's very empirical we do a series of experiments we wait for the results and we hypothesize design the next set of experiments we go in that direction so that's what we did during the pandemic and i don't know if that can be replicated again uh, during for during peacetime uh, in terms of using ai and uh, ml um, we, we are, more, as of now at least, we're focused on using AI and ML in our manufacturing. Uh, we're trying to incorporate that into our QC testing, into our manufacturing activities. Uh, as a large-scale vaccine manufacturer, we have a lot of activities called qualification and validation and calibration of equipment. These are high-end electronic mechanical equipment. But then those we can we are using leveraging AI and machine learning to figure out when is the right time to do calibrations, when is the right time to do validations, whether all the equipment, you know, it was very common for us if we have 8,000 pieces of equipment, they all come on a standardized calibration schedule without knowing whether it's meaningful or meaningless, the data. Now using AI, we're able to predict 
which equipment needs to be calibrated when and so that we can go forward that way. Okay. Well, uh, Naveen, you know, one of the themes which, uh, which I think Mr. Reddy also touched upon is basically the China plus one factor uh, playing out. How substantially is it playing out from an MNC's perspective currently? Uh, and do you think that it's a tangible opportunity for India, especially uh, considering that we have the U.S. elections, there's a chance that the Republicans could come back. So in yeah. that context, how big an opportunity is it? I think it? in terms of uh, capability centers, India has always been the leader. Um, so over 50% of the centers in the world are based in India already uh, because of strong language skills, science skills, technology skills, and the demographics, as I said. So the, the, uh, for, for international companies, this continues to be uh, even more attractive location now, given that the companies want to leverage uh, the centers for transformation, digitization, beyond just getting work done, they also want to move forward in the work, really. So I think this is uh, already playing out very nicely for India. Okay. All right. Uh, well, Anurag, you know, the company has received funding from the likes of CDC, maybe I think around two to three years ago. The funds were expected to actually encourage infrastructure in low-income states. Give us a sense in terms of the progress of the projects, as well as whether that's opened the door for funding within the space that you operate in. Sure. So we leap as a company, right? I think uh, if you look at uh, agri-infrastructure in India, it's a relatively new thing that's being modernized. The opportunity started coming out in the last five to six years, and we at LEAP have been uh, forefront to it. And uh, we've been supported by very good, credible investors like GIC, CDC, and all you've just mentioned. And uh, I think uh, companies like us have a responsible role to play in encouraging young entrepreneurs, because if you look at India, what I was just mentioning, 1.4 billion of population and millions of opportunities, right? And in India, when you try to do things, the first time it doesn't happen, but if you're persistent, it does work. So I think uh, my two-point take here would be that agri-infrastructure is very key and AI plays a very critical role in uh, helping it scale and being competitive because India can't afford expensive agri-infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Jain, election year, uh, what is the opportunity that you seek uh, or are you expecting from the infrastructure space? Do you expect uh, spending to probably slow down a little or do you expect it to augment probably post-election? No, we don't see any slowdown. India is really doing fabulous, specifically post-COVID. Uh, not only China plus one policy, even all the domestic industry also, they are doing the capex. And uh, we have not seen, in fact, it is the river other way around. Last two years, as I told you earlier, the industry is going phenomenal way, and we don't see, as of now also, hardly one or two month federal election is left. There is any slowdown in the, you know, order intakes or fresh projects. I don't see. I mean, it is going to be continuous in a, a bigger way growth, actually. Okay. Well, Mr. Prasad, you know, $10 trillion economy is what we are aiming for. Do you think that by then we will have an indigenous innovative drug from India reach the global markets, or maybe even a vaccine? I think we already have uh, Indian innovated and R&D patent protected vaccines already. Yeah. We have a couple of them. I know um, uh, other companies like Serum Institute of India and Biological E already have innovative yeah. vaccines that are developed in India. They have patent protection in India and other parts of the world, and they're also sold in more than 50 or 80 countries, depending on. In terms of small molecule pharma, I think uh, Mr. Reddy from Dr. Reddy's answered your question. Uh, there is a lot more work to be done. Uh, but I would say the vaccine industry, I would say, is definitely a step ahead in innovation and in R&D, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And we know the value of that uh, protecting intellectual property, not just others. If we don't protect that intellectual property, I, I'm not, I know for a fact that companies like Novartis would never partner with us. So we already partner with uh, MSD and GSK. That? What's that? Uh, you, which companies wouldn't partner? Any, any large multinational uh. company that is having a lot of innovative products uh. would, would, uh, would not be interested in partnering with an Indian company if Indian companies are not protective of intellectual property, not just ours, but also theirs. So that's why we have partnerships with GSK. We manufacture a malaria vaccine for them, and we're now partnering with them to develop the next generation of malaria vaccines in partnership with them. So these don't happen if you don't show value to intellectual property.
correct that point is taken but bharat biotech would that would they probably look to maybe diversify into small molecule r&d uh, at the current time no we're focused heavily on large molecules uh, vaccines we're looking at certain uh, i wouldn't call it biosimilars but monoclonal antibodies novel ones and also we're looking at gene therapy okay. as the next step of what we should be doing as an organization but we're also focused on infectious diseases were focused on tropical diseases were focused on the diseases of low income countries and middle income countries and you know, we're not focused on us and europe at least at the current time so you're working for india to probably get better to get to that 10 trillion dollar economy absolutely i mean we expect uh, i i know the 10 trillion dollar economy is not i know in somewhere in your write up you called it a dream i request you not to call it a dream it's a matter of uh, it's a matter of when is not a matter of if i'm sure about it and uh, i mean i make a very simple statement you know less than 10% of our country's needs are met you know population wise if you think about it 90% of our country their basic needs have to be met yeah and if all of industry or agriculture services we work towards providing those needs i think 10 trillion will go way past 10 trillion okay well anurag you know just leave us with one line and i'm going to ask the panelists just a brief one line about what is the one measure which you think india needs to take to get to that 10 trillion dollar economy i think uh, man for uh, people are very important and upskilling and reskilling is really important okay all right yeah, pavan i believe skill upgradation is very important and we need to do a lot of things in this area okay and navi india needs to be science focused needs to pivot to trusting and believing and investing in science okay all right investing in science reskilling and upgrading uh, upgradation of the workforce and, and lose the fear, lose the fear of failure fail early fail often <laughs> and so learn from that failure <laughs> okay all right uh, well gentlemen thank you very much for joining in into this very innovative discussion um and uh, let's see uh, maybe reskilling upgradation as well as investment in science is something that we need to focus on thank you very much thank you so thank much thank you thank you so thank much thank you so much gentlemen may i request you to please stay back All right, time now for a quick felicitation. May I request Mr. Manish Jain to please come up on stage for the felicitations. Manish Jain, Country Head, Wholesale Banking, Yes Bank. life is one of the leading life insurance providers in the country and it aims to be the most respected life insurance company in india by ensuring financial security of its customers is maintained through comprehensive protection and long term savings solutions to tell us more about its vision we have with us a change leader with over two decades of invaluable experience and expertise in finance leadership and strategy Prashant has carved a distinguished path as the managing director and chief executive officer of Max Life Insurance, a stalwart in the Indian banking and life insurance industry. He is known for his unwavering commitment to people and customer centricity. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming on stage Prashant Tripathi, MD and CEO of Max Life Insurance for a very special address. thank you mukda good evening ladies and gentlemen <clears throat> it is indeed my pleasure and an honor to be standing here in front of you uh, 
and listening to the industry leaders who have not just achieved for themselves uh, many laurels and outcomes, but are also architects of the foundation that is required to create the 10 trillion economy. Uh, I completely agree with the point that the debate is not about whether we'll be 10 trillion economy. I think the challenge is about when and how fast. And the how fast question is rooted in how fast we grow, the GDP growth rate. Uh, as per the, the growth rates that we are witnessing just now, it is highly likely that somewhere around 2031 we will hit that number. But I think the bigger debate is how quickly can we get there and how well do we get there. And the quick question or the question around speed is linked to the subject today, which is around innovation. The more innovative we become, the more differentiated we become, the faster we grow. And equally, how well we grow is rooted into how financially inclusive this growth is. In the absence of great ideas, good innovation, I think it will take longer. We might get there, but maybe longer. But in case we are not careful about how we are growing, then our growth will not be healthy. Some people will take the economy to 10 trillion, but there'll be large part of the society which will be left behind, and we don't want that to happen. Uh, and hence, I'm here actually to talk about both these elements. But more than that, uh, what a place it is to discuss innovation. Uh, nothing like Hyderabad. Hyderabad has been uh, at the forefront of innovation and has created a model which many of the states could just copy. Uh, <clears throat> I will talk about three different things. Firstly, those innovative ideas which have transformed and given confidence to us that we indeed could get to 10 trillion on the back of innovation. And I do want to talk about, call out a few things. Uh, the second one, is about Hyderabad and why Hyderabad is growing and what we, can, what we can learn from Hyderabad. And the last element that I want to talk about is, in my view, what are the things that we need to focus on to get to 10 trillion quicker? So firstly, talking about those innovative ideas. We use them every day, uh, the UPI. We use Bharat Pay every day. Uh, we use, um, or the country uses Aadhaar-enabled payment systems every month. Uh, we use payment wallets. But can we believe that a few years ago these tools were not available to us? Twelve billion transactions take place on UPI every month. And the population of this world is eight billion. So more than the population of the world are the number of transactions which are taking place on UPI every day. Uh, Aadhaar-based payments, and Mr. Kumar, Prashant Kumar talked about how beneficial it has been in terms of cutting out the leakage. 99.5% success rate. Bharat Pay or Bharat Bill payment system actually enables 125 million transactions, 30,000 crores of payment every month. These are really large numbers. And we achieved that. I mean, the, this, this thing's... These things existed. The payments did take place. The bills were paid, but the mechanism has changed, and it has not only created uh, convenience in our lives, but also has given us confidence that we indeed can pursue the agenda of innovation far more quicker. The second example is about innovation along with uh, inclusion. And the best example is uh, Jam, Jandhan, Aadhaar, and Mobile all coming together, creating a platform where <clears throat> billions of transactions are taking place now. 761 million accounts which are Aadhaar linked, and the payments are going there. These ladies and gentlemen happened over the last few years, and we didn't realize, but we are taking the advantage and benefits of that. Fintech disruptions. Uh, Again, uh, disruption not in terms of the outcomes, but I think banking, financial services, 
coming with fintechs, life insurance coming with insurtech, is really, a cre is really creating an ecosystem of collaboration, uh, which is propelling growth. Uh, the fintech business will be about $200 billion by 2030. Uh, will have asset under management of $1 trillion by 2030. These are really large numbers. Uh, digital lending growing at a fast pace. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is we must take pride in the innovation that we are seeing in the ecosystem, and I think that builds foundation for our growth, and we should expect that we will not take longer. In fact, we should take shorter to get to the destination, an intermediate destination of $10 trillion, and eventually as our Honorable Prime Minister says, by 2047, hitting a number of upwards of $30 billion. Coming to my second subject of Hyderabad, and uh, you know, I've had deeper connects with Hyderabad, not just uh, in the job that I do. Uh, we have large presence here in Hyderabad. Uh, but one has witnessed Hyderabad transform so beautifully from being a historic city to now a tech city. Uh, it is definitely the second destination in terms of new startup, uh, new ecosystem which is being built. Uh, we just heard uh, the CEO of T-Hub talk about some of the examples. And the beauty with which the entire ecosystem of startups, talent availability, technology, investors, and academia has come together for the city of Hyderabad is really noteworthy, really, really creditworthy. Uh, I was looking at some data. Uh, global capability centers are talked about quite a lot. Last year, uh, about 17 people set up global capability centers in India. Eight of them, 40% came to Hyderabad. Uh, I was looking at some data of lease uh, being done. 32% of corporate leasing of the top seven cities happened in Hyderabad. This is how Hyderabad is growing. And all this is happening because of a very proactive model of policies. Uh, you know, the ICT, uh, the, uh, the innovation policy, uh, uh, the portals which are set up, uh, the ease of doing business which the state has adopted, those things have really helped Hyderabad become what it has become today. And I'm sure in a few years to come, there'll be many more examples like Hyderabad in our country, and that will build foundation. So people who are from Hyderabad, really, this country must be proud of. Uh, what, in my belief, is going to create uh, or take us to the 10 trillion part really quicker? Uh, there are five or six areas. Firstly, stability of policymaking or stability of maybe, if you're lucky, about political regime, because to an extent, the polit politics and policy making are linked to each other. I think things are working for us. Like in corporate setup, if a management team performs, we should just continue with it. In my sense, at a very high level, this is what this country needs. And maybe the progress that we have made over the last 10 years is a reflection of continuity of, uh, of principles, of policies, and I think that helps. But more than that, I think macroeconomic uh, consistency is also important. Uh, the combination of monetary policy and fiscal, uh, as a result, India has been doing quite well. Uh, if you look at last few years post-COVID, our performance, our outcomes on, uh, on inflation has been superior to other people. Our interest rate regime has worked out quite well. The stress that Western world had to go through, perhaps India just came out quite unscathed. And that, I'm hoping that that continues because that will be a big ingredient towards building the 10 trillion economy quicker. Prashant Kumarji mentioned a few things. Investment in infrastructure, that is needed. Uh, we have done some good work, especially around uh, roadways, uh, ports, but I think more and more work towards uh, you know, building other parts of infrastructure, even roadways, is needed, and that will, that will require capital, uh, and that's a must to hit, hit the 10 trillion economy. Uh, continuous build-up of startups. I think not just from the perspective of job creation, but new ideas, energy, uh, catalyzing the growth is dependent on how well we are supporting the ecosystem uh, of startups, giving them credits, making their, their lives easy in terms of doing business, 
uh, availability of easier tax regime, those things are required. If we look at the digital public infrastructure that got built and many things that we're talking about now is being built, it's like guardrails or it's like the track on which the vehicles move. And I think all of us put together will have to continue to build on the basic digital foundation which has been created, all the sectors. I always say collectively we can come together and think about the country, but any big plans should have small plans, right? Likewise, maybe the industry that I represent, uh, insurance industry, will have to figure out what is our plan for 2032. Banking industry will have to come together and decide what is their plan. Every industry must have a plan uh, because when all the plans will aggregate, maybe we'll hit the number. <clears throat> I think technology will continue to evolve, artificial intelligence, Gen AI, uh, which will require investment. But one area that we must continuously talk about is uh, the cybersecurity part. I think investments must go because as we evolve, risk management to in the area of technology will become equally important. And last but not the least, perhaps skilling must go on. We will need people who will deliver the outcomes. We will need very, very skilled uh, people while we will have large number of people. But how are we skilling, how are we enabling, will also play a big role. Uh, I think with all these three co things coming together, I'm, I'm quite confident uh, that uh, sooner rather than later, we will hit the 10 trillion mark. And I just wish uh, that when we get there, we grow in the right manner, where people at large, the 140 crore people, most of them are beneficiary of this growth, not just a small fraction, because otherwise our growth will not be healthy. Thank you very much, and let's wish all of us all the best so that we hit that national mark as soon as we could. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that address. Well, the upcoming address promises to transcend the conventional boundaries of business discourse and delve into the fascinating realm where science meets strategy. Yes, it is now time for a very, very interesting and rather intriguing address titled The Neuroscience of Innovation. Now, we have with us a leading neuroscientist, someone who is often called India's brain enhancer. He was the global policy head on aging and neurodegenerative diseases at G20, B20 summits. He is one of India's top experts on high performance for leaders, brain computer interface, photobiomodulation, cellular healing, longevity, futurism, neutroeconomics, and much, much more, which he's going to talk to you about. Please join me as I welcome on stage Kumar Bagrodia, leading neuroscientist and founder, Neuroleap, who will now speak to you about, do leaders have different brains? All yours. Thank you, Mukda. Um, thank you, CNBC and Yes Bank. Uh, I'm going to talk about the neuroscience of innovation. Why do you think uh, innovation happens? Any, any shout outs? Why are humans able to innovate? Necessity, yes. Sorry? Survival, absolutely right. Absolutely, we can't, uh, there's no progress without innovation. So the human species is the only one in the universe that can imagine a future that doesn't exist. We are not where we are because we beat other species in terms of size or shape or brute strength. It's only because of our brains that we can see something that doesn't exist and then we collaborate with other humans, with people in the same species to make that imagination into a reality. That is something unique to humans. But the problems are, we are also designed for survival, right? Our brain is designed to do things only for survival, and we are also very resistant to change. 
So then how is innovation taking place if these two hold true? Because luckily there is a counterbalance in our brains, which is that we are stimulated by two things, by exploration and by discovery. So we want to experience new things, new tastes, new flavors, new places, meet new people, see new things. We want to discover. It is this exploration and discovery which enables us to then imagine. So like somebody said, survival. There are two important triggers for innovation. One is boredom, right? So very often people innovate, companies innovate, individuals innovate if they are already in a certain level of comfort, right? So let's say you're a financial institution, a pharma company, a med tech company, an infrastructure company, you already need to have certain things going for you at steady state before somebody can say, hey, you know what, let's do something different. Or you need to be fighting for survival. It's one of the two. Sometimes it's both. If it's a very large organization, different parts of it could be facing one of these things. So what is innovation from a neuroscience perspective? It is the meeting of brainwave patterns that were earlier unrelated, which means they existed in you, in your organization, in your own brain, but they were not really related that time. And I'll tell you wh why this is important. How does this happen then? How can we get new brainwave patterns? So first is exposure. Right? You get exposed to different ideas, different experiences, people, locations, all of that. But also to access new brain patterns. So, so how many times have you been in a, in a meeting or a brainstorming session where you will call somebody from an, from an interdisciplinary background and say, hey, you know, we are talking about, let's say, finance, but let's have somebody from another domain in this meeting. Right? Or we are, this is a tech room, but we'll get somebody from marketing, so on and so forth. Or even from sports or performing arts and so on and so forth, where you will want to get access to a new way of thinking, a new brainwave pattern, which your organization or that group of people doesn't have currently. The third thing, very important, is how can you gate your senses, which means how can you reduce sensory input to your brain. So it's not continuously then just processing that, but it's in quiet mode. To innovate, that's the third most important step. The last two. How can you get access to divergent, non-linear, unrestricted thinking? There is no way you can innovate if you're in the same set of parameters, same rules, you have to sometimes put problems on the top of their head. So how can you be divergent? And the last one, I know we, you know we look at it badly in a corporate environment, is to daydream. Neuroscientifically, it's proven that the final stage for innovation is when you're in daydreaming mode, which means in a state of relaxed wakefulness, you're not really doing anything, you're just relaxed, and you're daydreaming, is when all of these subconscious patterns can actually throw up answers either to a problem or throw up a solution or a creative output to your consciousness. I know I've been talking a little bit about brain waves, and let me tell you why. So our brain is really just about patterns and energy. What are patterns? They are emanated from this number. This is 1,000 trillion, one quadrillion. That's the number of neuron connections in your brain, each one of us. At each of these connections, data is being transferred. Bioelectrical energy is changing from one place to the other. We store about 2.5 million GB of data in our brains. And where is most of the action happening? It's at the cerebellum, which we earlier thought was like the mini brain or the little brain, 
this small little orange part in the rest of your skull, that has 80% of the neurons. That is the command center for all your cognitive functions, your attention, your emotional regulation. And I'm sure you're thinking, well, you know, in decision making or in business or in innovation, what is the role of emotion? Right? More than you think, actually. So we use how much percentage of our brain? Any shout outs? Sorry? How much of our brain are we using? No, no, that's, that was just to fox you. 2% is the ratio of your brain mass to the rest of your body weight. So if you weigh 75 kgs, your brain is roughly 1.5 kgs. I mean, uh, unless most of your 75 kgs is just pure dead weight fat, then it's probably not. But this 2% body weight is using one-third of your energy. So if you're having a 1,500-calorie diet, 500 calories are consumed by your brain. Why is that happening? Because we have gone from a physical load society to a cognitive load society. We are constantly processing information, which we don't even realize is information. Sights, sounds, colors, television, mobile phone, data. Our brain is taking in 11 Mbps of data. 11 million bits per second. All of us. But our conscious mind only processes 50 bits per second. So then where is the remaining data being processed? It's all by your subconscious brain, which is three lakh times more powerful than your conscious mind. Three lakh times more powerful. 99% of who you are is your subconscious brain. That's the speed of data travel in your brain. That's also the speed of the bullet train. So just imagine, just this much space, and that's the speed at which information is changing hands between one neuro neuron synapse and the other. Can you recognize some of these habits? Anybody shout out if they have been prone to this? I have mapped 18,000 brains in India there is not one individual who's not been prone to maybe two or three of these at least. All of us. And it's not good or bad. It works for you at certain times. Sometimes being irrationally optimistic is great. Sometimes, you know, being in a loss aversion zone is great. But you can't go through life completely like that. So these are all patterns in your brain. They are subconscious. Who wakes up in the morning and say, I will be loss averse consciously. I will be mindfully loss averse. No. I will be irrational. No. We all assume that human beings are rational individuals, but that's far from the truth. So we discussed that your brain is just about 2% of your body weight, but consumes one third of your energy, which means... It is so heavy in terms of mass to energy consumption. To conserve its energy, it creates patterns. What are those patterns? Those are the biases, the habits, the ways of thinking, your mindset, who you become, your character, your personality. That's your subconscious. Repeated interactions over time, the experiences of people, places, things, objects, make you who you are. So in terms of high performance, what we do then is we actually map your brain and give you objective insights into those patterns. So just by reading your brainwave data, we can understand your cognitive as well as emotional basis for your behavior. Who are you at the very core and why are you behaving like that? And then you can actually enhance them using customized technology-based sessions. That's something that we already do.
Shifting gears towards energy, I mentioned that the brain is all about patterns and energy. One of the building blocks for energy is mitochondria. It's a part of your cells. The reason why we eat is to feed the mitochondria. The reason why we breathe is to help the mitochondria generate energy and clean up its processes. ATP, it's called adenosine triphosphate. It's the cellular currency, the energy currency of your body. You cannot breathe without ATP. Your heart will not beat without ATP. You cannot think without ATP. Just to elaborate on its importance, each neuron in your brain has 2 million mitochondria. So we've got 100 billion neuron, and each neuron has 2 million mitochondria. And each of them is consuming 4.7 billion molecules of ATP every second. Your brain, on an average, is consuming about 6 kgs of ATP a day. Your body is consuming equivalent to your own weight. And this is one of the ways to generate more energy for your brain, body, and your cellular processes called photobiomodulation, which is how can you use light to power your mitochondria? So essentially, certain specific wavelengths of red and near-infrared light get absorbed by the mitochondria, and they produce more ATP. Now imagine if the power cells in your body are able to generate more energy without any more glucose input, without any more food input. What does that mean? It means this is higher efficiency energy, energy which was produced without you having to do more work. So that energy is available to your brain and your body and your cells for better healing, anti-aging, anti-oxidation, anti-inflammation, so on and so forth. So we agree, knowledge is limitless, yeah? We have Google, we've got the mobile phone, we've got AI, which is overtaking human consciousness. So AI is writing books, poetry, creating art, creating music, creating movies as well. So in this environment, how will you win? It's going to be your subconscious patterns. And yes, you can change your subconscious patterns at any age, you can figure them out, you can understand why you are the way you are, and use technology to change your patterns. We've just got about a minute left. Happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you. Thanks. All right. No questions? I'm surprised. Maybe they, you, you, it happens all the time that everybody comes later to you and yeah. asks all those questions <laughs> about how leadership brain can be different. And uh, neurosnacking is what we were talking about yeah. the other day, how uh, in New York, uh, the CEOs and CFOs after their lunch hours are going for neurosnacking to get their brain waves yeah. uh, stimulated. <laughs> so yeah, all the leaders out here, you can uh, basically... Mob, sure. uh, Mr. Bagrode after this. Uh, before I let you go, uh, may I request uh, Mr. Prashant uh, Tripathi, MD and CEO, Max Life Insurance, to please come on stage and felicitate uh, Kumar with souvenirs courtesy Yes Private and CNBC TV 18. All right, time now for our next panel, which is titled Beyond the Norm, Redefining Innovation for Progress. And it is dedicated to Hyderabad's emergence as a city of innovation poised to reshape India's economic landscape. With a focus on inclusive and sustainable development, Hyderabad stands as a prime candidate to lead in sunrise sectors and establish cutting-edge 
production capabilities. This discussion will serve as a platform to shed light on what sets Hyderabad apart from other innovation hubs and its vital contributions to India's envisioned $10 trillion economy. To moderate this session, may I invite on stage Jude Sanith from CNBC TV 18. Let me also invite his esteemed panelists, put your hands together for Mohit Jaju, Director, Godavari Drugs Limited. Dr. Pani Baruri, MD, Algoleaf Technologies Private Limited. Mr. Ivy Ramana Raju, co founder and CEO of Fabric Steel Structures. And Mr. L.S. Patil, promoter and MD, Patil Rail Infra Limited. Over to you, gentlemen. Right. I believe that each and every one of us who listened to Kumar Bagrodia's talk just a few minutes ago can agree to one thing, and that is innovation and progress simply go hand in hand. And if there's one thing that, or one common thread that connects the both, it's simply the fact that neither of these two have a static state, given the fact that they must always be moving, always evolving. And that brings me to a very interesting panel that I have with me, which talks about how innovation ought to be redefined in the interest of progress. So without wasting any more time, I can't help but start with you, Mohit. I know for a fact that, you know, Godavari Drugs, which you help run, there are some key focus areas that you look at as far as the R&D aspects of the company are concerned. How do you think innovation is powered at the R&D business in order to ensure that your business keeps moving forward. First of all, thank you, Yes Bank and CNBC for having me here. Coming to your question, I think the larger R&D you can, in terms of pharma industry, can be broadly defined into two parts. One is development of new products, of which Mr. Satish Reddy and Dr. Sai Prasad have spoken enough. The second segment of the R&D, what the country needs to focus on, or is rather focusing on already, mm -hmm. is redefining the applied sciences, which is the engineering, redefining the processes by improving the processes in terms of cost efficiency, in terms of safety efficiencies, in terms of green technologies, where we are more conscious towards the environment, and manufacturing at a larger scale the quantum, as we talk of. So this is what we are focusing on. Mm -hmm. And this definitely fuels the, rather should be fueling the next uh, round of growth. Absolutely. And manufacturing at that scale, I'm sure, leaves plenty of potential for innovation. And we'll come it to does. that in it just does. a bit. But before I get any further, Dr. Baruri, I have to ask you, as a company on the cutting edge, really, when it comes to enterprise digital transformation, I'm just curious, do you think companies in sunrise sectors in Hyderabad I know they're faced with two options when they embrace digital transformation, when they embrace innovation. It can only be one of two things. Do you feel the step-by-step -step incremental potential is what they would rather face? And do you think it's a process of simple improvement? Or do you, on the other hand, think that embracing digital transformation and this big change of innovation, at least from their perspective, could, on the other hand, hamper business growth, at least in the near term? It's got to be one of the two, at least in the near term. Which one is it? Uh, thank you, US Bank and CNBC TV 18. I think uh, uh, I, would, I would actually put it in one sentence, right? I think you should have a mindset of disruptive digital shift, but the approach should be incremental, mm -hmm. right? It can't be one because it depends on the size of the company, size of the sector, uh, the location, the people you have, and all those things, right? I think Sunrise sector is inherently innovative. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, innovations are easily accepted by the people, right? And being a sunrise sector, you have a lot of competition, you have to stay ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. uh, to stay ahead of the curve, I think the digital shift has to be rapid. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you do a rapid digital shift and fail. Uh, what you have to do is start with incremental, get the digital foundations right, right? right. When we say digital foundations, it means uh, 
I'm talking from IT or any, any perspective, right? Do I have data in place? Do I, do I have infrastructure in place? Are my processes automated? You have all of them, uh, you know, uh, uh, you have that foundation. Now go big bang and do a uh, disruptive digital shift. I think no, no. it's no brainer. It has to be a combination of right. both. And striking that balance, like you said, I think is key to any innovation, at least uh, in keeping in mind both the risks and benefits right. involved. Mr. Raju, that makes me come to you because it's, a, it's an interesting case study that we're talking about here. Um, at Fabric Steel Structures, pre-engineered buildings is something yes. that um, is discussed, I'm sure, on a day-to-day -day basis. Given that we're talking so much about infrastructure growth as far as the country and its immediate future is concerned, um, no doubt real estate infrastructure is a very key component of that 30 trillion um, target that India has. Uh, do you think that pre-engineered buildings will, cards on the table, at face value, have key advantages over older and legacy processes? If yes, quickly enlighten us on what these advantages are and what is the innovation potential really that we're talking about? Yeah. Uh, pleasure being here and thanks to CNBC and S Bank. Yeah, you rightly pointed out in the growing economy and this technology uh, moving forward at a faster pace, mm -hmm. definitely steel buildings are going to take at a very right spot in the construction industry. The basic advantages of steel buildings are you can construct much faster. Mm -hmm. Now, you can see in Hyderabad, actually, we are talking about Hyderabad, how it is going to be forefront in the mm -hmm. technology advancement in terms of construction, technology, biotechnology, and uh, pharma. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the construction also, the acceptability of steel buildings in high-rise buildings is very good in Hyderabad compared yeah. to other uh, cities. So what is the penetration that we're looking at and what is the factor of growth, steel versus the older processes? Yeah, it is year on year, it is increasing. Okay. And the growth for uh, this industry is CAGR of 15%. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one of my uh, ex-colleagues spoke about uh, this uh, innovations in this industry. Mm -hmm. Definitely, we need to see how this penetration of steel construction into uh, uh, infrastructure industry. Going forward, we are going to see a lot of uh, non-availability of uh, skilled manpower. Mm -hmm. So we manufacture, we design the building as per the custom requirement, all our styler made buildings. Mm -hmm. Then we design, we manufacture, install at site. Mm -hmm. So these factory made structures are highly quality controlled and less manpower is used at site mm -hmm. and much faster construction. Right. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you will agree with me that no talk of India's innovation will be complete without talking about the railways and the manner in which that department really has bloomed and grown over the last few years. Uh, so many topics to talk about, really. But Dr. Patel, you know, as part of your company, the fact that there's so much innovation that's being spoken about, I think just yesterday it was the railway minister, um, Ashwini Vaishnav, who said that, you know, forged wheels versus, you know, um, the older style of wheels would not only be made in India, but also exported from India, the wheels used in the Vande Bharat trains today. Do tell me, how has, uh, you know, Patel Rail Infra helped when it comes to innovation at the Indian Railways? Thanks, uh, S-Bank and CNBC for having me here, representing the rail sector. As you rightly said, uh, rail infrastructure is one of the key drivers for the Indian economy. Mm -hmm. And very specific to your question on innovation uh, within the rail sector, we could see many examples. The big examples, the COVID threw a challenge of, you know, importing wheels. So that's where the innovation came in and they said that, why not we have our own forged wheel plant here? Right. And the only obstacle the Indian industry was facing was the long-term contract for this. And that's where the government came up with a 10-year demand. And that's where we have now one of the finest four steel uh, plant coming in and uh, coming to Vande Bharat train itself. Absolutely. And again, an innovation from within the country, mm -hmm. developed by Indian railways, by Indian uh, engineers, and today it is the poster boy across the world. Mm -hmm. Today we are already talking about exporting Vande Bharat across. So now coming to specifically to at Patil Rail, we have been focusing a lot on innovation. Now, let me talk about the digital part of what we do. We have a digital uh, company. We have a, uh, what we call a startup within the company. Right? Mm -hmm. So we are now doing uh, a cutting-edge 
systems and solutions for digital monitoring of the rail track. All right. So track maintenance has been a very uh, manual oriented kind of a thing, right? So you need huge number of people, key men, what we typically call, they have to go and, you know, uh, inspect more than 150,000 kilometers of track, which is becoming very, very difficult and getting people to do that kind of job. So now we have video monitoring. So we have set up certain uh, condition monitoring. So very high speed cameras that are attached to the trains. They just go around as the train moves around and you know, immediately de detects what kind of faults are there on the track and immediately reports and goes to the cloud. We have image processing and artificial intelligence sitting there to tell you that what are the exact defects and where the defects are. Mm -hmm. So this is an, one very important thing that we have worked out and it's now uh, already panned out in the market. Then we have for the rolling stock wayside, uh, wayside systems where we monitor the wheel axles, the temperature on the wheels, on the axles, and the problem with the bearing using acoustic technology, using uh, beams, multi-beams, so detecting any problem with the wheels. So mm -hmm. that's another thing. The wheel impact load detector is another thing where we have flat wheels, which is disturbing the track and leading to derailment. So taking safety as critical, because that was the mission critical statement mm -hmm. by Honorable Minister. And uh, we took that as a challenge. And today, it's an Indian company which is now able to do it. And now we have orders from New York Metro. We have orders from Sweden. So right. now India, with providing the solution not only to Indian railways, this innovation and this technologies will now be available to the global market. Absolutely. And ladies and gentlemen, this is Indian innovation, I'm sure, at its finest, all poised for growth, not Absolutely. just here, but on the global scale as well. Absolutely. But, but, you know, but, you know, I need to come back to you, Mr. Mohit. You mentioned a little while ago about how scaling up will be a very critical part of Indian innovation. Um, I can't quite help but think back to the, uh, you know, bulk drug park that's supposed to come up at Nakapali. What will that do for your business, really? Will you see a shift in production capacity closer home to um, Hyderabad? Uh, and does, you know, scaling up and catering to demand uh, for an industry at large also, what does it do to the kind of work that you're doing uh, on the infrastructure front, on the innovation front? Are you ready for the scale up, really? So, yes, I mean, uh, just as like the park coming up at Narkapalli, there are almost all the states in India, the state governments are focusing on creating good industrial mm -hmm. parks with, uh, you know, so-called amenities mm -hmm. and common facilities which are required otherwise for the industry to provide for themselves. Mm -hmm. So what it does effectively at a very... Uh, I would say at a reduced capex, mm -hmm. you can still have those facilities and the industries can be more compliant to what the requirements of the day are. All right. And, of course, volumes, licenses become easier because these are all pre-licensed parks. So your environment clearances, you don't really need to go to mm -hmm. uh, public hearings. Mm -hmm. Uh, B2 category, it can happen in a year, which can otherwise take maybe three to four years. Mm -hmm. So a lot of advantages of being part of these kind of parks. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, effluent treatment plant, I mean, from the kind of industry background that we come from, that's a huge challenge. And the cost involved is so high, both from the capital point of view and from the operating cost point of view. Mm -hmm. Operating cost, yes, the industry has to bear, there's no option. But CapEx, at least if there can be a common infrastructure which is created, and an effective infrastructure which can meet the global demands today, mm -hmm. we need to be conscious towards our environment for the next generation, for our own generation, right. while managing the growth. Right. So these kind of parks are really going to drive mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the scale of operations to the next level. Right. Coming back to us specifically, I think our manufacturing uh, focus is more towards Maharashtra and Telangana in the bordering areas. So I don't think we are, as a company, looking at uh, Nargapalli right now. But mm -hmm. I think these kind of parks overall will definitely help in a big way. Absolutely. And Dr. Baruri, even as we talk about bringing production capacities closer and, you know, uh, shoring down on our capex, even as we have these capabilities um, at hand, the fact remains that Hyderabad has this distinct advantage of having tech-centric growth for the longest time now. It's been probably the most familiar story that we've all read about, watched with our own two eyes happen right in front of us. Do you think this serves for an excellent template 
if India were to achieve its $10 trillion target by 2030? Uh, are there lessons to learn from Hyderabad and its tryst with technology? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you need to look at uh, four factors, actually, right? You need to look at the regional strengths. Uh, I think uh, every region has its own strength, whether it is, uh, you know, in terms of uh, developing pharma or you go to the port cities to develop uh, logistics, you mm -hmm. go to uh, mining for uh, northeast. But I think, as you said, I think IT is universal, but I think you need to look at the regional strength. Uh, where you have availability of a lot of talent and educational institutions. I'm sure India is, mm -hmm. I think, universally doing it everywhere, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's number one, right? Um, uh, I think uh, uh, COVID has also uh, uh, taught us a good lesson that Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities right. can be a great uh, option in terms of lowering your costs as well, right? People have... Uh, were used to sitting in ODCs, restricted environments, have gone to their villages mm -hmm. with the excellent internet infrastructure that we have, are able to actually work on the clients' products and platforms through VPNs and other stuff. So that, that tells us that you can actually work from Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities, right? Absolutely. Great examples. Uh, I think I came to know very, uh, you know, not recently, but at least a few years back, is Dehradun is doing extremely well Right. in IT actually because of its proximity to Delhi and mm. other places and people uh, want to go there, nice environment, etc. Right? So one is the regional strength, uh, two is upskilling and reskilling. This, this uh, I, I see as, a, as an IT entrepreneur and being a digital product engineering services company, I see that these people stop learning actually, right? Mm. I think skilling, reskilling uh, is very important for the existing workforce and also right taking that skilling to the rural parts of India is very important. I think you, you need to tell them how to do uh, coding. Yeah. You, to, you need to give them the technological know-how. I think those are very important, right? Third thing is uh, digital infrastructure. We have, I think uh, India has, I think, uh, has one of the amazing digital infrastructures. Mm -hmm. Definitely it will aid whether it is open network digital commerce where you can use the platform to do any kind of commerce. Uh, you have UPI, everything is linked to Aadhaar, you know, your digital identities are well established. I think these are all very good recipes, right? And government policies, of course, sure. right? And, you know, I, I, and I'm glad that you make a, la a large part of that answer more about talent because even as we spoke about or always speak about the tech-centric growth of Hyderabad, I think brain drain was something that we also often associated with this topic of discussion. But it's the reverse today. You're seeing Hyderabad actually attract talent as opposed to losing it. And that's not a claim that I'm making. I think LinkedIn's future of work study says it. What do you think has changed? If you get what you wanted uh, outside in your home country, I mm -hmm. think uh, you'll come back, right? Absolutely. So that's the plain answer or simple <laughs> answer. So I would say, I think uh, Mr. Srinivas Mahankali was saying that they are, there are 320 global capability centers, mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of expats uh, who spend most of the time there are, are coming up in leadership positions and middle management positions mm -hmm. and are enjoying the same kind of comfort, uh, affordability, their kids have a lot of uh, opportunities to go to educational institutions in Hyderabad, in context to Hyderabad. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, and, and then I think we are moving from cost arbitrage to value also, right? So mm. your brain is also stimulated. You Absolutely. get to do a lot of innovation now in India, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, uh, and the great value addition part that India offers, I yeah. think, is probably our greatest export given the times that we find ourselves Absolutely. in Absolutely. Today. You know what, Mr. Rajo, I have to come to you next. Even as we speak about innovation happening day in and day out right in front of our eyes, you represent a sunrise sector in manufacturing that's looking at growth projections of 13% year on year. How do you prepare yourself to match that kind of growth simply in terms of demand and this rapid scale up in production, do you see any challenges arising in terms of actually going about meeting this demand and having to scale up production? What are these challenges? No, as such there are no challenges, mm -hmm. but we can expand, we can put more plants, mm -hmm. but the availability of skilled structural engineers and all is becoming really difficult. That is going to be the challenge. Mm -hmm. Manufacturing front, there is no challenge. Mm -hmm. So if we can bring in technology, so we do the design, detailing, manufacturing, and installation at mm -hmm. site. Mm -hmm. If we can connect, 
uh, using AI and machine learning mm -hmm. to this all independent activities mm -hmm. and integrate everything, we can even produce faster. All right. So the time consumed in design, detailing, and project management can mm -hmm. be reduced. All right. So that that can increase the scale of uh, production and site activities and well within the control of our data. Well, investment. what do you know? Money is time and innovation yes. clearly helps yes. save both money yes. and exactly. time at its greatest. Uh, yeah. Dr. Patel, quickly over to you. You spoke to us so much about all the innovations happening in the Indian Railways and how industry is helping power that. Very simply, sir, what do you think has changed with regard to how big infrastructure projects were conceived and executed in the past vis-a-vis -vis what's being done today? Surely there must be some change that you're seeing, innovations aside. There is a dramatic change. Now we have something called as Gati Shakti. Of I'm course. sure you know that what it is, just for the uh, sake of reputation. Gati Shakti is an integrated approach where you have rail, road, and everything integrated and all the clearances that are required to be taken is on a portal. You know, for, for example, if you want to build one rail line, you, ne you need to have about 10 different clearances. Mm -hmm. And that was getting stuck in whether it is forest, whether it is land acquisition, or various other statutory clearances. Everything has been integrated digitally, and every, every information that is needed for any decision maker in various departments is all available. And of course, now we have a very strong leadership which has set timelines for clearances. All right. So that, 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 that the Gati Shakti has, is a major, major impetus uh, what we see from the past to now, which is helping for faster <coughs> clearances and faster implementation of the project. Above that, now we are looking at mechanized track laying. This is another very, very important part of uh, which many of them may not be knowing. As we discussed today, the government of uh, the Indian Railways have decided to go for mechanized track laying. Typically, what we have seen is a lot of manual way of, uh, you know, if we want to build 10,000 kilometers of track now from the current 3,000, 3,500 target that we will achieve this year. So there is a huge amount of mechanization bringing, uh, being brought in into the construction of the track. All right. You and, know, these are, and these are massive changes. These no are all very especially... big massive changes that will drive the growth. That will ultimately contribute. And keep the innovation element Absolute. also going. But I want to very quickly get the last word from three of these gentlemen. Even as Dr. Baruri spoke about how brain drain has pretty much ended because of the talent, the overabundance of talent, I have to ask you. Your company does well, make profits. What do you do with them? Invest in enhancing present-day capabilities or look, or look to make new forays? Which would be the way it, you, you go forward? It has to be a combination of both. Mm -hmm. It can't just be one. Mm -hmm. We definitely need to survive and sustain and grow on what we are doing today as our strength and venture and explore into new areas as well. All right. And that's a two-pronged approach that you will take, of course, in yeah. keeping with innovation itself. And Mr. Raju, even as India is in the midst of a warehouse boom, we spoke about how consumption has pretty much hit a peak. Yes. How do you see, very briefly, warehouses change and evolve in keeping with present-day innovations? Yeah. Uh, we need a lot of warehouses across India, mm -hmm. and the material handling efficiencies has to improve to the large extent. We need hub and spoke model right. uh, across India from the major cities and major manufacturing hubs to villages, rural areas. All right. uh, it is going to grow at a faster pace, and we are working with a lot of warehousing companies as well. Right. So hub and spoke model in line with the demand that you see yes. moving forward. Yes. And the last word to you, Dr. Patel, I know for a fact that uh, even as we talk about all these innovations, one big challenge is the global supply chain situation. We're seeing ebbs and flows. It's go gone up, come down, geopolitical issues are a big deterrent to, you know, doing business in a steady manner. How do you navigate these challenges? Maybe two, three points, uh, a cheat sheet of sorts to get around them. Make in India. That's it? <laughs> Absolutely. Make in India, for India, and for the world. All right. I think being truly Atmanirbhar will solve so many of these problems. And with that, gentlemen, a pleasure speaking to you all. Innovation and progress can, will, and must go hand in hand, and hopefully we'll be a part of that ever-evolving process. Thank you so very much for these insights. Thank you. It's been Thank an engaging you, conversation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Gentlemen, may I please request you to stay back on stage. Thank you for that wonderful, wonderful dialogue. And now for the felicitations, may I request Mr. Rajan uh, Pintel, Executive Director, Yes Bank, to please come on stage and
felicitate our guests with the souvenirs courtesy Yes Private and CNBC TV8. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now for a very exciting conversation. This discussion is centered around the theme from roles to roadmaps, stardom strategies. From his stellar performances in action-packed thrillers to his heartfelt storytelling in cinematic gems like Major, Gurachari, and Shanam, he has carved his path to excellence beyond his cinematic achievements, his humility, compassion and unwavering dedication to noble causes make him a true role model. Join us as we celebrate the remarkable journey of this versatile artist whose presence brings luck and charm to every project he undertakes. Please welcome on stage Adi Shesh. <laughs> Shesh, this is a very, very different uh, audience, I guess, for you. We are sitting in a growth summit and everybody is keen to uh, uh, pick your brains on your business acumen as well. Uh, no, I'm, not very, uh, I'm not very smart on the business end. <laughs> but uh, actually, you guys are in my hotel. We shot a lot of major here, so very nice to meet you all. Hmm. All right, um, let's first start to talk about uh, what social media is talking about at the moment, G2 and uh, Decoid. Um, are these the projects that you're most excited about? What is 2024 looking like for you? Yeah, it's going to be a lot of uh, shooting for these two films. Um, G2 is the uh, sequel to my film Gudachari, um, which came out in 2018. It sort of uh, recreated the spy genre for Telugu cinema. And uh, with G2, we're actually uh, taking it national in terms of how we're making it. We recently added uh, Imran Hashmi to the cast, mm -hmm. and we, uh, we really hope to take it to five different Indian languages. Uh, um, Dekoit or um, Dekayat in Hindi, we're shooting that in Hindi. Um, ah. with, uh, it's Shruti Hasan and I, uh, where we start that next month. Wonderful. Um, major we have to talk about because it is a film which is very close to your heart. It also sort of uh, broke uh, a, a very uh, huge image of yours which was in a, in a different genre. Uh, but a, a lot of people don't know that Major Uni Krishnan was your real life hero much before you decided to write about him and make a film about him. Uh, you are close to his family, you are now close to his legacy as well. I'm sure this was an emotional project. How did you prepare yourself for it? And now that the film is done and it has been received so well, but you know how it happens with films, people move on. Will you ever be able to move on from this film? I, I, I don't think, I mean, I think I've moved on from the film. I don't think I'd want to move on from him. So I think it's two very different things. Um, you know, Jesse Bachchan sahab ke fan hote hain. I was a fan of Major Sandeep Punikrishnan from when I'd seen his picture on the TV. 
back on the 27th of November, a day, day after the attack started in 2008. I remember it was on the TV Asia channel in the US. I grew up there. And I remember seeing him wondering, who is this person who looks like he could be an older brother of mine? In fact, uh, I was shooting today until 6 p.m. Um, the only reason I uh, thought it might be interesting to speak about it today is because today is his birthday. Oh, how wonderful. So, um, a way happy birthday. To be very honest, I was very exhausted yes. to come, but I, w I thought an another moment to uh, speak of his legacy was important to me. Right. Um, uh, so when you say, have you moved on, I'd say this. When I met his parents, they, you know, they're 79 now, and he's their only son. So when I met his parents, they, the only thing that they asked of me is to say, even after they're gone, um, the idea of him and the legacy uh, of what he stood for should continue. And a part of me being here today is uh, in order to continue that. You also have a project by that name that uh, is talking to youngsters about uh, how they can join army and uh, is, that I, a, is that a project uh, that uh, will I, continue? I did start it and after a few months of us pursuing it, we'd spoken to various chief ministers in various states. Uh, the Agnivir scheme came into play. So it's a little bit tricky for us as civilians to kind of navigate that idea. So I largely keep my uh, donations private towards education of children or animals. Mm, wonderful. All right, let's talk business now. <laughs> you are not just an actor, but you are also a producer, you're also a writer. Was that a natural process, like a transition that was expected, or was it induced by circumstances and um, uh, where you were at in the industry at that point in time? Absolutely necessity. You know, um, I come from outside the business. Um, I had a cousin who was a director, but he was up and coming as well. So we had both pursued separate paths, and I didn't really know anybody beyond him. And uh, I'm one of those guys, I, I suck at auditioning. So I always understood, you know, matlab acting karo taake, you know, ek theater mein hazaar log baithke, you know, you, you make them cry, you make them laugh, whatever it may be. Lekin ek room mein baithe baithe teen log aapko judge kar rahe, mujhe, I don't know how to handle that, you know. So I, I, I was never any good at auditioning. And when you come from the outside, um, there's no reason for a producer to want to pick you. Yeah. Because uh, as you said, if we're talking about business, it comes down to like, okay, I put $100 on this guy, what am I going to get back? You can't just say, sir, my talent is, see you know? Mm. Um, I, I feel, I still feel that we're a nation that uh, rewards um, a PV Sindhu after she wins the Olympic medal, rather than investing in creating 10 PV Sindhus. Um, so uh, it was out of that necessity that I started taking a hobby of mine, which is to write. Mm -hmm. And I started writing scripts for myself. Uh, I'm told you're quite the devil on the set. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> I, do, I, I do my research well. <laughs> and, and that you're a hard taskmaster. And that uh, uh, when it comes to budgeting and when it comes to production costs, you are somebody who will squeeze out the maximum <laughs> from your team. So the question then is... Yeah, yeah, the um, <laughs> um, you know, in the times of abundance filmmaking, when everybody is spending, you know, one of the things that becomes noticeable about a film is that it's a lot of money. You know, people go only to see a good thing, so they will be able to see a picture. In these times, um, I also want to know as a businessman, um, how did you decide on getting the most out of the money you put in and uh, what, what are you like on the sets? You know, I think that, that comes down to, again, uh, my passion. I mean, I've always dreamt bigger than where I stood. You know, uh, my my logic was always that you dream for the stars, you fall on the treetops. Um, you know, um, so I remember my film Kshanam had done very well. It was my first sort of big success as a lead actor. It was uh, remade in Hindi as Bagi too, remade in five or six Indian languages, remade in Sri Lanka as well. But I was, it was in that state where people were like, achha, thik hai, is pe 10, karo to laga sakte hai, lekin isse zada nahi. That, that was that time in about 2016, 2015. And, you know, and I immediately was dreaming of a Gudachari which required a 30, 40 crore budget. But it wasn't going to happen. So the, the key was to work really hard. What you can't pay for with money, you pay for with energy and time. 
um, I believe to make a great movie, you got to have two out of three things. And the three things are uh, your effort, time, and money. You've got to have time, you got to try hard, and you got to spend hard. You don't have money, uh, you got to spend a lot of time, and you got to put in a lot of effort. So it's always two out of three that makes a great film. If you only have one out of three, then you know what happens at the box office. What's with the production costs? You're known for bringing out <laughs> the best out of uh, uh, a lesser... Uh, you, uh, be, uh, your films look more expensive than you have spent money. Is that your mantra? Uh, it was, uh, especially coming from a sort of independent film background and the kind of uh, filmmaking I'd studied in San Francisco. Um, but truth is, I think it's just about... I, I'm always going to be, you know, uh, my next film's uh, touching a three-figure budget. But the thing is that you want to make something that looks three times that. That's always been the goal. And additionally, I think the reason why stuff always looked expensive is that I believe you can't buy taste. You know, I was recently in somebody's house. They had this huge mirror. They had a Mustang parked outside. Everything was looking really, really expensive but gaudy. So the goal isn't for stuff to be um, rich looking. The goal is for stuff to be elegant looking. Um, collaboration is key for any industry. And um, uh, you, everybody who's sitting here who's uh, working in the startup, um, you know, startup environment, or even when we're talking about great teams, uh, every single person plays a role. Uh, in, in that sense, when you're looking at collaborating with directors, producers, fellow actors, what is it that you seek? Because uh, a lot of times work culture is so different. Uh, in Telugu industry, of course, it is very different from any other industry. Um, what is that one thing that you look for in all these partners? Because sometimes it so happens that you've got to work with whoever is big and is available and is ready to put in the monies. But does your own... Uh, Set, set of uh, prerequisites come into place? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it also depends on what stage of your career you're at. You know, when I was starting, I was just like, man, if somebody would just hire me, that'd be great. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just think it depends on where you're at. And I think today I'm at the stage where uh, I'm only interested in believing, uh, in working with people who believe in a common goal. The common goal being we need to make an extraordinary film. Um, I'm not in interested in sort of, uh, uh, you know, Telugu film industry mein bolte hai, package films. I yeah, chalo, is hero, is heroine, wo director, tuck, 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 package kar diya, bech dala picture ko, you know. I, I'm not interested in that. Um, which probably makes sense as to why, you know, my last film released in December of 22, and I'm, I've just begun shoot. So I spent a year writing. So I'm only interested in working with producers, directors, um, co-stars who understand that kind of a goal. There's a lot of actors who sort of get their freedom and their sort of kicks mm -hmm. from doing two, three films in a year yeah. because for them it's like, yeah, I want to be different people at different times of the year. Mm -hmm. And I think that's amazing. I don't know how to do it. So I think uh, I'm at that stage in my career where I'm interested in working with collaborators who have that fundamental need to tell something extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you see work across different platforms now? There's OTT, there is, um, of course, films. Uh, television is always popular, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of actors are also coming on television shows. Then, of course, there's YouTube and social media. Um, there are, we are living in a very different time where you have to evolve yourself and your craft to the business. Having said that, is there one particular medium that you really enjoy? And in times to come, uh, is it always about what you want or is it always about what the public wants? Where is that balance? I think, I, look, I've always only been interested in theatrical films. Um, I remember as a kid, I uh, watched Rajnikanth storm onto the screen in Basha. And ever since I saw him do that, I wanted to either see him, meet him, or be him. You know? And I think that it's been the whole pursuit uh, of a career in that sense. I've always believed that, you know, I, I make a small joke. It's, it's, in good f it's in good fun. I don't mean it really. But uh, the joke is, when we sit in the theater, we when you look at OTT, you can look at it like this, you know? Um, so I... I <laughs> so I... Uh, Wonderful. Uh, I make that joke. But truth is, I think, uh, w you know, we, we need to uh, 
we, we all want to tell stories, and I think different stories are suitable for different mediums. You know, if, if you look at a series like The Crown, it's suitable to yeah. the OTT medium, and it's probably higher budgeted and more watched and than most format. theatrical films. Very long format, yes. So, so I just think it depends on the story you want to tell. Mm -hmm. um, so everything else other than acting has happened because of circumstances. So tell me now, uh, if you get a chance, would you just go back to just acting? And if you were to go back to acting, how are you going to stop yourself from being the writer as well and the producer as well and director yourself in, in your head at least? <laughs> I am so exhausted writing these two films. I'm very happy to just go back to acting. <laughs> I just got to make sure that I'm getting the great stories and the great roles. That's all it is. But does it happen to you that you are doing something which you are convinced that it's not good, but the director's asking you to do, uh, the producer's asking you to do, is there, uh, do you find there is a scope of that kind of dialogue? It, it happened to me. I mm -hmm. was uh, doing the uh, South Indian remake of the film Two States. Mm -hmm. And I think I loved the original so much that there was mm -hmm. a part of me that wanted to do it. I signed on, we started shooting, and I could see it going wrong in many ways. Mm -hmm. So after about 10 days shoot, I put a pause to it. And I set up the producer with another producer of mine. They're going to get him reimbursed. And we're actually just going to do a different film. Mm -hmm. I realized that we aren't um, telling a story that's being the best it can be. Um, so it was very important to me that uh, we only do that. So, yeah, I've, I've mm -hmm. been in that situation and I've walked away from it. That's a brave choice to make. A lot of people don't get to exercise that choice. But I'm glad you are in that space where you can do that. Um, a lot of times we talk about uh, feedback, and feedback of any kind is very important, um, uh, especially as an actor where you are exposing yourself to feedback of all kinds. How do you take uh, criticism? Does it bother you for a long time? Um, what is your um, mind like when you read certain things about yourself? I think there's three kinds of criticism today. There's the uh, general critique of the media, mm -hmm. which, is which is professional critique, right? Your critics watching criticism. the film. Mm -hmm. Then there's social media, <laughs> which is the average person either saying they love you or trolling you. Yeah. And then there's people who meet you and tell you what they thought. Mm -hmm. I pay most attention to the people I meet because they are people I trust and they're in my inner circle. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it becomes tough to take, um, even if it's a professional critic's opinion, um, I remember um, when um, Indian Express reviewed my film Gudachari, and it had done so well at the box office. It was, an, it was at the time a 9.1 on IMDb. Mm -hmm. um, the critic uh, in that paper, he wrote, um, he's only made this film to satisfy his dreams of playing James Bond. <laughs> now, I don't know how this guy decided that he can get in my head and decide what I wanted to play. But uh, I thought... That was a personal attack. You're not mm. commenting on, yeah, mujh acting nahi lagi, mujh story achhi nahi lagi. You're not talking about that. You're talking about this guy mm. wanted to do this. You're talking about my motivations of making a film. Mm. That's not very professional. Mm. And then social media told him, yaar, ab, koi bolega, <laughs> you know, are you're only 6'2". Koi bolega, you're 6'2". You know, koi bolega, you, you don't look South Indian. Koi bolega, you don't look North Indian. You know, all this True. stuff. You, you just take that with a grain of salt. Mm. Talking about social media, you know, and uh, social media is something that's very important for businesses as well, um, because everything is, if it, if it isn't on social media, it never happened, is what they say. Uh, having said that, 24-7 scrutiny, judgment, and the good and the bad and the ugly, you know that it is the demand of your profession to be on social media, to expose your life to a certain extent for your fans. But it's got to take toll on you. How do you keep that sanity? Oh, man, that's... I don't think that's, a, that's, a, that's an answer anybody truly has. I think we all try our best. Mm -hmm. I'm, just, I'm just one of those guys, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a millennial. So what happened was I was on that cusp where I saw the analog life mm -hmm. and I saw the digital life come in. So I don't feel the pressure of needing to post 20 pictures of myself a day. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll just go radio silent for like two months on Instagram and, you know, my manager is not happy with that. <laughs> so so to, be, to be very honest with you, I've not been very good with social media. But I figure you make a great movie, it makes up for it. You know, there was a time when uh, you had icons, you worshipped them, but they were enigmatic. And they were, their lives were very away from you. From the point of view that you knew very little about them. 
Today, everybody is on social media, and that's the reason why there is constant pressure on performers as well that they need to keep their audience engaged even when they are, say, not making a film, they are not making uh, uh, news, um, uh, to be specific. How do, you, how do you look at some of the young actors? What is the kind of toll it takes on them if you have to be on social media day in and day out? It's very different for this generation of actors because you constantly have to expose yourself to so much. You're every time of your day, you know, you, it's almost like I'm having this meal, should I post about it? Your team might be telling you that, you know, kam se kam hafte ki itni post soni hai. But you know that it, it's a lot of pressure. Most definitely. I think, um, you know, so many people, I, I know a lot of actors who will look up, ki yaar, is hafte mein mere mein kitne news articles hai. Mm. And, you know, you, you start wondering, if uh, you, you start wondering if you're relevant. I think for me, what I've realized is there's so many people getting hit with so many information about so many movies mm. and so many TV shows and so many sneakers and brands and everything else. I'm okay if they forget about me for six months because they only need to remember me mm. when my next movie's coming out. Mm. So I usually start ramping up my social media about three months before my movie's about to come out. Um, any other business interests other than your own field? Uh, Look, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of highly eminent businessmen and women here, so I, who am I to say? But I, I, do, I do have a feeling that I wanted to share. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, the, the feeling is, I, I think we all speak so much about, you know, the, you know, we're speaking about the 10 trillion economy and GDPs. I think uh, uh, it, it's very important to look at capitalism from a, a place of responsibility, um, from a place of emotional ownership, um, but at what cost? Um, I think that's, that's very, very important. Um, and, I, I don't, and, and I realize, I, I think there is something called responsible capitalism. And I feel like as a country, I'm a bit worried that we kind of starting to run away from that and per perhaps even adopt the American approach, which is mm -hmm. unfettered capitalism. But it's come at great cost to their environment. It's come at great cost um, to the middle class over there. So, uh, you know, I just thought uh, I'd share my sort of illiterate actor's opinion <laughs> <laughs> on that. Uh, before I let you go, one last question on what are some of the trends that you are seeing in your own industry? I know uh, you have lived outside of India. You have, you have um, a more uh, sort of um, worldview. Uh, you watch a lot of stuff that is uh, put outside. Um, what are some of the trends that you see are coming in India and the filmmaking? And also, when we talk about the industries and we talk about ESG chatter, we talk about sustainability, we talk about inclusion, we talk about all of those things, where does film industry come in when we talk about these SDG goals? Is there a way of bringing them in in your industry? Yeah, film's messy, yo. Honestly, it's very, very messy. You know, we're suddenly going into a location, 400 assemble, and we're shooting and making it home for like three days and leaving. It's like every mm. day of shooting on a film is like doing a wedding. Mm. So it's tough to be sort of eco-friendly when, when doing a wedding. So mm. it's like that. But I think um, I don't believe in the whole carbon neutral footprint. Like you try and, you know, neutralize it by doing something else yeah. somewhere else. But I try to sort of avoid plastic on my sets at all costs. Um, within my own life. I don't wear leather. Mm. Um, I wear leather looking objects, but I don't wear leather. So, I mean, I, in, my small, in my own small way, I try, but then at the end of the day, I still arrived here in an SUV, so what am I saying, you know? <laughs> so we try. <laughs> Any trends that you see coming into your industry from a world perspective? Uh, absolutely. I think um, India today is sort of uh, very much so at the forefront of um, film... Um, I, w I would say film styling. What I mean by that is when we, w what we are starting to do as filmmakers is something that the world is watching. So when they speak about something like the Bolt camera, um, we're using it here, they're using it there. Everything that used to take 10, 15, 20 years to come to us is coming mm -hmm. immediately. And, we, and they're watching what we do with it. Um, especially with, when, when you take what a film like Triple R did. Um, uh, a lot of Americans are now suddenly exposed to this sort of Telugu unfettered heroism <laughs> that, uh, that we're setting, and uh, I'm a big fan of that. So I, we're definitely in a situation where we're not only 
uh, following the trends coming in, but we're setting some. Shesh, thank you so much for this interaction and for taking out time for us. It was lovely talking to you. Thank you. Appreciate it. May I just invite Prashant on the stage for the felicitations, please. Just a second. Join him, Manish Mitri, Zonal Business Head, South Yes Bank, to please come up on stage. And Mr. Pentel, for a photo op and. Thank you so much. All right, if you thought we are done, we are not. Well, this was exciting, but we have another one super exciting waiting for you. Welcome champions and enthusiasts to a session that promises to ignite your spirit and fuel your ambitions. Today, we are honored to be in the electrifying presence of none other than Saina Nehwal, a name synonymous with grit, determination and unparalleled success in the world of badminton. Welcome. Smashing success, grit to global stardom. We were talking about that as the theme of your, uh, uh, of your chat with us. And it is only right to go back to the times when we saw your grit as you were rising up to be the world number one and global stardom. And now you're showing that famous grit all over again, uh, coming back from your injuries. How was it different then and how is it different now when obviously uh, there has been uh, uh, less amount of scrutiny back then, more amount of scrutiny right now? Uh, age is a factor, things have changed. What has kept you going? Um, I think uh, it's definitely difficult for all the players. Um, not only me, but everyone is fighting, fighting out. Um, sports is very risky. Everyone takes risk here to become the best in the world. And um, some lucky ones don't get injuries often, but some, some do. But finally, it's about uh, you know, winning and doing well. Uh, sport is a field that you can play for a little time, but you get a lot of things. Hmm. And uh, doctors and engineers are very few, but sports persons are very few. <laughs> and I know it's not tough. <laughs> and I know it's not tough for a player. Ke liye. You know, when you start playing, uh, you don't even think of when you're nine years old, you're like, why will injuries happen? Why will you even think of all those negative things? You're just sure. playing for fun. You want to do well and you're enjoying yourself. Suddenly, you, you are winning so many titles, you're everywhere. And these small injuries are like in the newspapers and everyone is asking you, injury ho gaya, kitne din lagenge ab aane ke liye. Um, I think khatam ho gaya career. And at that point of time, you know, I didn't even have uh, good physios or... Right. I got my first physio when I was 19. I already played the Olympics in wow. 2008. And I won the world championships, junior world championships, wow. junior commonwealth games. I won my first uh, Philippines Open in 2006, uh, beating world number three. And uh, played the commonwealth games, got bronze medal <laughs> over there. So all these uh, things happened to me. And 19, I knew that I was a physio. And that's, 
and obviously you when you are playing for so many years you need to have good trainer to give you good exercises True. but my trainer my physio and everyone uh, everything was uh, coach ab mm. coach hi batate the ye karo wo karo and it's uh, you you are following him because you know you just want you to win you want to do well really better yes that's and, true and uh, hats off to my mom for putting me in such a sport to jahan pe paisa nahi hai sponsorships nahi hai kuch nahi hai but she was like nahi meri beti olympic uh, medalist banegi world number 1 banegi at the age of 10 she was very confident you know she was she should tell me you will do well you will achieve it and i was like how is it even possible you know i have not seen anyone crossing first second round in any of the tournaments before right. me i didn't have any role model jisko main bol saku yaar mere samne world champion khel raha hai ya olympic champion khel raha hai i had all players uh, who were national champions and they wanted uh, finally ek job mil jayega to kafi hai hmm. so these were the thoughts you know uh, at that point of time ke uh, luckily uh, my group was not like that right. i was always a very shy person so i used to just go to my mom and she used to be like tujhe job nahi chahiye tujhe olympic medal chahiye that's oh, not wonderful. what you're aiming for so uh, luckily the strength was good body was good and um, at the age of 19 i won my first super series as well yes. and that's when the physio was there and he was like kahi pain ho raha hai kya kuch massage karu kya ya kuch aisa i think no i'm fine bhaiya you know i i used to be very scared <laughs> what is this you know i don't need any kind of treatment but then comes the uh, i became world number 2 and then yeah. uh, comes the challenge for um, um, you know uh, 2010 me three back to back super series titles right. and uh, slowly i understood how how it really matters that uh, aapko uh, support bhi chahiye ek physio ka aur trainer ka and it started very well at that point of time but i never thought that i have i've already pushed my body for 10 11 years so my knee started hurting already by, uh, then and i had to take a break for 2 3 months and everyone used to be like very tough india mein the first thing what they talk is very tough Yeah. it's impossible to come back <laughs> i know so that's when you know i think my uh, team my mom my father my uh, coaches were very supportive they were like saina you always come out of uh, this situation you know mentally you're very strong you uh, you know ju- you just be positive and don't think much about what people will say you'll be out for some days but you have uh, so much of talent in you that you can beat anyone in the world yeah so these were the few good words they used to tell me um initially i used to cry i used to feel bad but hota hai na bachpan mein bhi aap rote hain aap fail ho jate hain then you go to your mom and mummy hai mahab mein fail ho gayi ya haar gayi so i was like mummy same injury ho gaya log aise baat kar rahe hain waise baat kar rahe um uh, then mummy used to be like kon baat kar raha hai mujhe bol you know she used to be like she is always a very strong woman she is always like koi kuch bolega to bol mujhe you know i will talk back and i will main dekh lungi usko so she is always been there and tough times also she is be like no no problem इवन द चाइनीज आर ह्यूमन बींग्स उनकी भी स्किन है वो कोई ऐसा नहीं है कि जादू से आप नीचे लेके आ गए यू दे आर बीटेबल दे यू कैन अचीव इट सो ऑलवेज दिस काइंड ऑफ वर्ड्स रियली मोटिवेटेड मी फ्यू डेज आई शुड नॉट लाइक टू गो टू जिम यू नो आई वॉन्ट टू जस्ट सेट एंड वॉच टीवी सो माई पेरेंट्स इज टू बी लाइक हम जिम जा रहे हैं थोड़ा जिम कर लेंगे एंड तो जिस अगर हमें सपोर्ट करना है तो आ जाए हमारे साथ देन आई शुड बी लाइक यार घर पर क्या करूंगी देन आई शुड गिव कंपनी टू देम एंड दैट्स हाउ यू नो अगेन आई आई यूज टू फील um trading karna and i have to get back and my tournaments are coming up players only think about you know every time every minute next tournament is what is there mm. how is my recovery how is my rest uh, whom i am play, playing against why is that girl beating me again and again so throughout the year you are just thinking about all these things and 20 tournaments in a year so the pressure is so much that you don't even sleep you know sometimes you do meditation and you are like yaar neend acha aa jayega but that is when also you are thinking uh kal matches ke sath hai kal match ke so you there's no point of time where yeah. you are actually resting and injuries just add up to that injuries sure. is such a difficult phase for any player yeah. i don't know you know some people get acl injuries i, I remember rio olympics yeah but I, it was not acl i, yeah. I could come back in 3 4 months yeah. but acl takes you out for one year yeah. and i can understand how bad it is after one year to start from zero yeah. you know your ranking goes down everything falls you know it, and you're just like how to start from zero again so the uh, already you are down mentally and then to get back that confidence you are winning tournaments so it's always a challenge you know whether it's four months or one year you are sitting at home and doing nothing it's your job you want to be there mm. even one day feels like a year you know? i can imagine it's so difficult mm. but it's always uh, in the mind to be positive i can be the best i have to come back and you know 
hmm. do what I do best, winning. <laughs> you know, that's that's what keeps helping me. And Kapil Sharma show, obviously, <laughs> my favorite show. <laughs> Fantastic! I think you have summed up a growth mindset so beautifully for all of us, uh, and resilience and agility. Uh, a lot of people talk about your Olympic medal from 2012, but very few realize that you were really close to winning yes. one in Beijing in 2008. Right. And you were just 18 then. Yes. Spotlight, jab ekdam se padti hai, usse khel par kitna asar padta hai. Although you have, uh, you, you just spoke about the criticism, but you know, when you are also doing very well, tabhi strutani bhoat zada hoti hai. So how, how do you cope up with that? Um, I think uh, for badminton, it was really good. In 2008, uh, you know, p people started watching badminton. They were like, first round be cross Kralia <laughs> Kisina. And actually, someone is in the quarterfinals. And um, in the village, in the Olympic village, I saw Abhinav Vindra winning, you know, gold medal on the first yeah. day itself. And I was like, yeah, gold medal is jeetna. I have to, I have to, I was so inspired by him. But of course, they get the medal in one day. And we have to play for five days. So it's like every day is that added pressure. and. Um, uh, I was so excited to see all the top athletes there, Rafael Nadal and uh, mm. Usain Bolt. Everyone was there and I was like, I have to get medal too. And uh, I was going really well, uh, very confident, uh, uh, trained so hard. And only thing in my mind was I have to give my best. I know that uh, I had to play world number four in the quarterfinals, but I was like, that's okay. You know, I, I'm mm. uh, giving tough fight to all the top players and what matters is just to give my best. And I, I really want to win the medal. So uh, sometimes when you really want to do it, of course, you get closer to it. And then in the quarterfinals, I was up in the third set, 11-3. Yeah. And there is no chance that you can lose from that position. Yeah. In my entire career, I have not lost any match 11-3 up. And I was like, I'm going really well, I'm moving extremely well, half smashes are going extremely well. And the coach also was, uh, Gopisa was also like, sub thik chal sub be patient, be patient. Because Olympics is something which comes once in four years and there is no retake. You know, yeah. you just have to go out and go all out and just be focused and, you know, think about playing in, playing mm -hmm. in the court, that's all. Yeah. And he was like, ab 11 3 up, just be patient, sub thik ho jayega. And what I, the girl told me after the match, her co coach told her, pack your bags now, you have lost it. And then suddenly, I don't know, 11, after 11 3, she was everywhere, she picked up all my shots. Mm. And I was just blank, I was looking at uh, Gopi Sir, she was like, don't worry, it will come, it will come, just be positive. And then suddenly the game changed and I lost 21 13, you know, I just got two points and she got the whole, yeah. whole uh, points till 21. And after the match, I was just sitting there and I couldn't believe it because I just needed right. that match to get the medal because I was, I think, playing the uh, playing Lu Lan from China in the mm. next round. And I beat her recently in the Singapore Open yeah. or somewhere. So I was very confident that ho jayega shayad. Only one person was uh, tough who won the gold medal, Zhang Ning. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the other players, you know, I, I was continuously playing with them and giving them tough fight. And after that, you know, I came out of the uh, court and I was sitting and I was like, or char saal rukna hai. It's so difficult. I know everyone was talking about Saina played well, first Olympics playing the quarterfinals. It's everyone's dream to play Olympics, to stand on the podium and see your flag go up. So your coaches are so proud. Everyone is so proud. So, you know, even I wanted to experience that. And because uh, when I was in fifth standard and, you know, I was uh, reading about Milka Singh Ji and uh, Usha, Piti Usha Ji and they just missed the medal. Yeah. And when recently I was in a conclave and um, um, the anchor asked her, how, 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 what do you feel? And she was actually crying, you know. Imagine... Um, Retirement hoke bhi tisa lo gaya hoga. But still she feels so yeah. bad. Players career, you know, career is so difficult that even after you retire, you feel so bad about that one particular thing which you made them, it's not a mistake, yeah. I would say, but it just, happens, just you know, it happens. Yeah. But uh, I was like, thik hai, char saal aur. I, uh, my targets was, uh, I am world number two, I have to become world number one. I have to win as many as super series possible. And next Olympics, I, I want to be seeded and I want to do well. So that, I kept myself positive. Obviously that day I was feeling really low. I had maybe multiple mm -hmm. number of ice creams and I don't know how, <laughs> how to get out of the t situation. I was feeling so sad. But uh, even uh, sir was like, tomorrow you want to train? And I was like, chhod do, ek do din to chhod do. I think I don't want to, you know, uh, talk about badminton. But next day morning at six again, I was like, let's go, you know. The motivation was so much that I just want to win it. and. I don't know when it will happen, but I was right. definitely sure it will happen. 
if I'm training right, if I'm doing things right, because whatever you train will show in the match. Right. There is no miracle, there is no shortcut, shortcuts in sports. Mm. What you do in training will definitely show in uh, uh, tournament. So uh, I, I was so happy that uh, next year I won my first Super Series and after that I won three Super Series back to back and I was suddenly like compared to Dhoni and you know I was everywhere I, I, and it was so uh, difficult for me to digest. Even the coach was like, "Itne sare media wale hain, kya bolu main? You know, first experience to, you know, face right. such things. It's, it's always difficult." And I was like, "What should I say?" And he was like, "Jo puchte usko bata de." <laughs> you know, we were uh, talking like that. It was funny, but that day I, I realized that if you perform back to back, how things change. Yes. Suddenly, badminton is the second most popular sport after cricket, yeah. and it's only because of the performances. And after that. The young kids are seeing Saina playing, she's world number two. And all of them are now in top 50. Yeah. We have so many people play, uh, in top 50 now that every year we have performances. There's not mm -hmm. even a single year that, where we didn't have performance. Yeah. And everyone wants to play badminton. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows us. Yeah. But it's just that, you know, that 2008 Olympics really changed the things for me. I'm happy that uh, today, that I got something to learn, definitely. But if it comes to that time, so hmm. things would have been different, you know. I, hmm. I think I uh, really trained very hard for that one as well. But I think that really helped me to get the Olympic medal finally. And after achieving it, when I have the medal, as you know, I, I, I hold it and I'm still not able to believe it that it's in my Olympic medal. Because, you know, they used you know, to say China versus Saina. And that was such a phrase that was uh, popular everywhere, at that everywhere. point in time. Everybody was talking about it. In top 10, yeah. in top 10 hmm. me and one more girl from Denmark and eight were from China. China, yeah. Um, now sports has changed, of course. Um, you have seen, uh, um, you have seen time when badminton was played um, way back when you started your career, now you're seeing it completely different. What are the three, two, three things that have come changed about the sport itself and, uh, of, and about the sports, sports women and sportsmen who are coming now? Sports person, let's use inclusive language. Sports person that are playing badminton now. What, what has changed? Um, I think now you have so many things around you, like so easily. You have academy, you have physios, you have trainers, you have uh, yeah. support from the age of 10, 11, when uh, I think uh, uh, some players at that point of time used to think, this sport mein milega kya to, they used to leave it because of the uh, problems with right. the uh, sponsorships and playing tournaments. So uh, after 10th, it is tough, you know, you have to take decision whether you want to yeah. study or you want to, because there is no, uh, you can't see a future in sport uh, that, mm. at that point of time. And uh, suddenly now you are like, you're actually seeing so many good things in the sport. You know, you have mm. a lot of sponsors who are helping you out when uh, a lot of organizations like OGQ, yeah. you know, Go Sports, they're helping a lot of athletes now who don't have sponsorships and um, um, th they are coming forward to sponsor them as many as tournaments possible. So, abhi ke jo generation mein koi bhi talented bacha game chhod nahi rahe. And they're there and they're seeing so many, you know, Satvik Chirag, Sindhu, me, Shrikant, uh, Pranoy, everyone is there. So the young, young kids are actually seeing all of us yeah. play. Yeah. And the leagues are also happening. Opportunities so, are also. So many opportunities, opportunities are there for them yeah. to watch actually, you know, to mm -hmm. see how the top players are playing, how they are training. Mm -hmm. So what we're training at the age of uh, 24, 25, they get to train at the age of 9 and 10. Yeah. So imagine by the time they're 15, 16, they're all, all already, already going to give good results. Yeah. And when we were, as I said, you know, 9 and 10, mein kaun tha, jisko hum dekke, you know, and there's, I still ask her, why, why role badminton? Role models are very, very important to uh, have mentors, Definitely. role models. In any models, sport, yeah. you know, I was like, bad, mujhe tennis mein dal dete. you know, it's not like yeah. bad, I love badminton or something, yeah. but I should love competing, you know, right. I should love competing. Or agar tennis mein bhi hota to, yaar, at least you can see very good future yeah. in that, but it's like, ab to late ho gaya, ab to is <laughs> focus kar. So I think that way. Uh, it's nice to see that a lot of young kids want to play badminton and they keep asking me, Didi, world number one kaise banna hai? Directly, mm -hmm. they don't even ask me state champion <laughs> kaise banna hai, national champion kaise banna hai. And I see them playing in uh, districts and state uh, tournaments and they're like breaking their racket and parents from behind, <laughs> they're, they're, they're actually telling them in the national tournament, ki tu world champion kaise banega hai, aise to. You know, the pressure, amount of pressure is too much. I feel that is the only one thing which is tough now, otherwise, all the things are perfectly good for all the 
athlete just that initial phase where you have to obviously spend some money mm. i think parents here they have to take little bit of risk right little bit of right. sacrifice is required to uh, be the best player and initially if they do that i'm sure the kid will uh, will do whatever he likes you know otherwise obviously padhai karna to kya hai you know even in 10th i i studied for what 5 days and i got 70% i still tell jo bhi agar fail ho gaya to i used to i actually laugh at them fail kaise hota hai kyunki itna difficult hota hai fail hona you know you have to really matlab kuch idhar hai nahi types you know it's like that but i studied for 5 days and 70% aa gaya i said study is easy hai you focus on your game till at least 10th 11th and um, sports person ki life bahut अच्छी होती है यू यू विल रियली एंजॉय इट वेन यू स्टैंड ऑन द पोडियम एंड यू आर एक्चुअली सर्विंग द कंट्री लाइक हाउ आर्मी पीपल डू इट यू नो इट्स इट्स सो नाइस टू सी के कोई हमारे कंट्री से पोडियम पे खड़ा है एंड एवरी वन इज लुकिंग अपू देम उनको प्रेस करते हैं देर सो मेनी अंक इट्स कम टू मी साइना दीदी जैसा बनना है इट फील सो नाइस टू हियर ऑल दीज थिंग्स एंड अब जैसे उनको अपॉर्चुनिटी मिल रही है फ्रॉम खेलो इंडिया फ्रॉम सो मेनी स्कीम्स to come up and play so many competitions aap to unko sign up train bhi kar rahi hain kaiyon ko how are you as a mentor and as a trainer on the on the ground uh, <laughs> let's talk about that are you a, are you a hatas master no 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 i i actually uh, <laughs> not looking forward to the coaching that much but yeah i definitely give advice and when they ask me about how difficult it is to be a champion and i'm like it is difficult you know i can't tell you like that because yeah. you'll have to experience it yeah. what i can tell is at that point of time when i was 14 15 when gopi sir turned into coach he he won the all england and he, he used yeah. to tell us um, you know khana acha khana padega because you will not get uh, jaise vegetarian khana khate ho aap bahar nahi milega and you will struggle so he made me turn into non veg at that non vegetarian at that point of time and he was like you don't have to kill yourself training 12 to 13 hours every day uh you have to train smart how the international players train and there are lot of things which he taught us at that point of time which immediately turned me into nash, uh, into mm. international level player to jo thoda sa touch ups chahiye the right. you you require you know koi internationally khela ho to those can give you good advice about about that so of course we have played from so many years we know uh, how it helps and uh, what to uh, what to actually do to get to that level mm-hmm. but um, you know finally physically unko dena padega court pe they'll have to struggle they'll have to fight it out again they'll have to struggle with injuries and everything so i cannot say ke you're going to win the tournament immediately but you'll have to try your level best listen to your coaches what they say eat right don't cheat <laughs> if you cheat that's bad for you yeah finally cheating is bad for yourself mm. you know you are you are actually if you really want to do well you will not cheat mm. you know i've seen so many athletes not from india but even abroad they tell me yaar ye nahi touch karna coach ne mana kiya hai i'm like ek din se kya ho jayega but ek din bhi matter right. karta hai ek din even on sunday it matters that if mm. i cheat i'm cheating myself yeah. and the coach is there definitely standing for us for 16 hours not only me but so many young athletes and he's looking after everyone's training so you got to be sincere so imagine yeah. he, he's just sacrificing his whole life you know his yeah. his wife his kids and he's coming there standing for you imagine obviously you get this knowledge when you are you're older you're not <laughs> like 9 10 mein to kya aata yeah. hai aapko dimag mein but you realize it after certain point of time you know when the right. team when your parents are putting it in your mind ki jeetna hai acha karna hai then after 12 13 i think you start understanding yourself and you are like yes acha yeah. karna hai jeetna hai competition you know that is what is important and if you are competing jo nervousness jo tension hoti hai usme maza hi alag hota hai you know that's how that's, that's how i can zoom in Yeah. Thank, Thank you so much Thank for this you. wonderful uh, conversation you. and I'm hoping that you know everybody who's here today and who's going to catch this particular chat is going to be very very inspired about Thank what you. exactly is growth mindset. Thank, Thank you so much you, for Thank your you time. So Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. A quick round of felicity. May I please request Mr. Prashant Kumar to come on stage and felicitate Saina.
Thank you. Thank you so much. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude the Hyderabad edition of Yes Bank and CNBC TV 18 present the Growth Summit vision for a $10 trillion economy. What we have witnessed today is a summit fueled with innovative ideas and perspectives that possess the potential to strengthen India's journey towards the $10 trillion pinnacle. Thank you so much for being a lovely audience and uh, have a wonderful